Good evening. My name is Jacob Webker, and I am the former president of the Sales FA chapter. On behalf of the Sales FA, I would like to welcome you to the Sales School and the 2019 Farm Bill Summit. We are pleased that you took the time to be here and learn from expertise in the field. We would like to thank the sponsors for tonight's program. Those include OSU Extension, Dark County, the Ohio State University, Ag Economics Department, and the Farm Credit Services. Let's thank these organizations and the individuals that represent them for all their hard work in planning this activity. <laughs> for housekeeping, housekeeping purposes, the restrooms are located to my left, as well as with some drinking fountains. Again, welcome and look forward to an excellent evening. Thank you, Jacob. Right one, Ben. Okay, I did the introductory one. We're not starting real well here, are we? I know. <laughs> so thank you, Jacob, and it's certainly a privilege to work with young people like we're, you'll get a, a glimpse of tonight. Uh, it's really good to know that we have strong people in agriculture, future leaders that will uh, guide us and direct us as, as we move out of the profession and they come in and we often focus on uh, the troubles and the tough times but we've got some really good people that will come in and, and fulfill roles here for us ladies and gentlemen we would like to welcome you to dark county not only do we have a nice crowd here tonight but we've got watch parties going on around the country and to our extension colleagues uh, Dave Marison and some of those in uh, the eastern part of the state. We hope your watch parties are great. I really wanted if we could have pulled this off like the NCAAs when they announced the, the seeds, it would have been great to be able to have them flash up here. But, uh, and to the other countries and Washington, D.C., we thank you for being here with us this evening. I'd like to express uh, sincere appreciation to Dudley Lips, uh, our crop insurance agent for Farm Credit Mid-America and Ben Brown, the farm management program uh, manager, for all their hard work in making this event happen this evening. Dudley and Ben, um, make sure that uh, we thank them for all that they've done. Especially Dudley, we want to thank him for the meal tonight, Dudley Lips and his crew. Uh, let's give them a round of applause. Many of you saw uh, probably pictures here a couple days ago. They were grilling uh, the pork loins. And Mike Winter with Winter Meats, Jim Dirksen, president of the Dark County Steak and Chop Tent, uh, Cade Stockslager with Crop Risk Service Insurance, Nicole Herod with Crop Risk Service Insurance, Randy Barkley with Rain and Hail Insurance, Kevin Montalaro with NAU Insurance, and then Farm Credit uh, people, Jeff Roth, Nancy Miller, Ryan Langenkamp, Terry Leedy, and Dudley Lips. Just great grill masters and put on a, a great meal for us tonight. To the Versailles community, thank you, especially to the Board of Education, the administration for allowing us to use the facility. We use this a couple times a year and, and they've worked with us very well. And also help me thank uh, Dina Webker, and the Versailles Ag Ed FFA program. They were here at one o'clock. I had this schedule, you know, at, at one o'clock we were gonna do this, 105 we were gonna do this. Well, at one o'clock we were gonna clear the cafeteria and set up the tables. So when I walked in at one o'clock, it was set up. It was awesome. What a great crew to work with. So, Dana, thank you so much. So, I'd like to call upon two Dark County 4-H ambassadors, Morgan Heitkamp and Ross Daypour, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance and the 4-H Pledge. Please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now the 4-H pledge. I pledge, I pledge my, my head, head to clear thinking, my heart to greater loyalty, my hands to larger service, my health to better living, for my club, my community, 
my country, and my world. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan and Ross. I share that with you tonight that we have been blessed to have a great partner and sponsor to help us with the program and to bring it to you. As I am sure you are aware, there's not another meeting like this in the country and could not have happened without the support, both financial and the professional staff of Farm Credit Mid-America. It's truly an honor to have with us this evening Bill Johnson, President and CEO of Farm Credit Mid-America. Mr. Johnson's held that role since 2011. He has a 30-year career within the farm credit system, starting as an analyst and finding his way to the position he holds today. He holds a finance degree from uh, the University of Evansville and an MBA from Gonzaga University. Mr. Johnson was recently quoted saying, we work hard to do our best for our farmers to help them make their operations as successful as can be. Mr. Johnson. We certainly appreciate everyone coming out this evening. I think you're going to enjoy the program. Uh, there's a lot of good information that's going to be shared this evening, both here and live streaming uh, uh, this evening. Uh, again, from our perspective at Farm Credit, we're a member-owned cooperative. Uh, it's been around for 100 years. And we're only a reflection of those people who own this company. And we were very appreciative of that, again, we're thankful to be able to be part of this program and one of the things you'll see this evening is various organizations who have come together to make this possible. And so it is possible to work together. Sometimes as agriculture we, we tend to go to our separate corners. In this particular case you see what a quality program would be put together when various universities and others in the industry can come together. Thank you again and hopefully you enjoy this evening. Thank you so much. Joining him uh, this evening from the uh, AgriBank board members, we have George Stebbins and Matthew Walther from Farm Credit Mid-America, Keith Lane, their executive VP, chief lending officer, Tara Durbin, senior vice president, ag lending, Steve Wittigus, senior vice president, ag lending, Jason Alexander, vice president, crop insurance, Brock Burcham, regional vice president, ag lending. And we also have a lot of other farm credit uh, employees and board members with us this evening. Let's thank all of them for being here. Also with us, we have uh, some other industry partners uh, from the Ohio Corn and Wheat Growers Association, Brad Moffitt and Brad Reynolds, from the Ohio Ecological Food and Farm Association, Eric Polosky, from the Ohio Soybean Council, Katie Bauer, Jennifer Coleman, Tom Fontana, and Emily Regula. From Farm Bureau, we have Yvonne Levesky with Vice President of Public Policy, Jack Irvin, Senior Director of State and National Policy, and Leah Curtis, Director of Agricultural Law. And finally, we have Bart Johnson, and, and Bart's center stage behind the camera, uh, owner and publisher at Ohio Agnet Country Journal, and his crew all here with us, uh, Colt and Joel, we thank you uh, as they live stream today so that this is uh, available to be seen around the country and, and a couple other countries, but also it'll be recorded, so uh, come next Monday morning and if you want to review part of the program, you'll have access to that and to be able to share that with others that you might want to see that. Bart, thank you so much. The FFA Creed. I started my profession uh, in ed ag education just across the street in the old school. And ag education and Versailles have been a very important part of my life and I wouldn't be here without ag ed and FFA. So um, 40 years ago, some of the first things we did was have the freshmen learn the creed. So and it's meant so much to me and there's different times I'm driving down the road just as Ben does reciting parts of the FFA creed. And I probably don't know it all today, but to share that with us, we have our Ohio FFA Sentinel, Mallory uh, Caudill, to recite the creed. Good 
Good evening, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here and represent uh, Ohio FFA, and uh, we're honored to be a part of this. Uh, the FFA Creed was written almost 100 years ago uh, when the FFA organization was started, and I think it's really awesome to see how that's reflected and how timeless the industry is, as well as the Creed. So without further ado, the FFA Creed. I believe in the future of agriculture with a faith born not of words, but of deeds. Achievements won by the present and past generations of agriculturalists, with the promise of better days through better ways, even as the better things we now enjoy have come to us from the struggles of former years. I believe that to live and work on a good farm or to be engaged in other agricultural pursuits is pleasant as well as challenging. For I know the joys and discomforts of agricultural life and hold an inborn fondness for those associations, which even in hours of discouragement, I cannot deny. I believe in leadership from ourselves and respect from others. I believe in my own ability to work efficiently and think clearly with such knowledge and skill as I can secure and in the ability of progressive agriculturalists to serve our own in the public interest for producing and marketing the product of our toil. I believe in less dependence on begging and more power in bargaining, in the life abundant and enough honest wealth to help make it so, for others as well as myself, in less need for charity and more of it when needed, in being happy myself and playing square with those whose happiness depends upon me. I believe that the American agriculture can and will hold true to the best traditions of our national life, and that I can exert an influence in my home and community, which will stand solid for my part in that inspiring task. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mallory, very much. We appreciate you being here. It is a lot easier to deal with uh, our commodity prices if we truly think back to that creed that many of us learned a few years ago, I believe. We'd like to introduce some of our government and agency partners that are with us this evening. Uh, we have with us from U.S. Congressman Warren Davidson office, Davidson's offices, Ben Thaler, he's the Deputy District Director. Leonard Hubert, State Executive Director with Ohio Farm Service Agency. Bruce Kettler, Director, Indiana State Department of Agriculture. We have Tim Derrickson, Assistant Director, Ohio Department of Agriculture. Dark County Commissioners, Matt Altman and Mike Rhodes, and we have other commissioners in the room, so we thank them for being here. John Everman, County Executive Director, Dark County Farm Service Agency, and many other executive or county executive directors and staff from FSA. Thank you all for being here this evening to help us. Jared Coppas, District Administrator, Dark County Soil and Water Conservation District. Jim Bennett, District Conservationist, USDA and RCS. And many other USDA and NRCS staff. We are fortunate to have with us this evening our Dark County Chamber of Commerce uh, President, Sharon DeChambeau, and Edison College Agriculture Director, Brad Lentz. So let's give all of them applause for being here tonight. It's a privilege for me to be able to call to the podium Dr. Kathy Ann Kress, our Vice President for Agriculture Administration and Dean of the College of Food, Agriculture, and Environmental Sciences, Dean Kress. Thank you, Sam. It's really my privilege tonight to welcome you all on behalf of The Ohio State University uh, and to share how proud we are in our college to also be the home of OSU Extension, the Ohio Agricultural Research and Development Center, uh, and also our Agricultural Technical Institute on the Worcester campus. This is a great example of what land-grant universities do, focused on partnership. Uh, tonight with also our partners from other universities as well as uh, our industry partners all coming together to combine our strengths uh, and be able to work together. Uh, in our college we believe that translating research, making it accessible and usable 
uh, is really important for us to be able to address today's challenges. Uh, you know, when we started uh, with our land-grant university, some of our most important challenges had to do with essentially how can we have the greatest yield uh, within agriculture. And now we all know how many more challenges uh, are ahead of us, none of them easily defined within one particular discipline. In fact, the way that I often think about it is that we're trying to do a number of things simultaneously, and it's the simultaneous that makes it so hard. How do we have viable agricultural production, food security, and our ecosystem sustainability all at the same time? We believe colleges like ours are critically important, not just for agriculture. We believe that a food scientist is just as likely as a medical researcher to be able to prevent cancer. We think that it'll probably be a soil scientist who helps us to solve our water quality problems. We think it's probably an economist who's going to turn that key and make it possible for us to understand how to make sure the best practices that other researchers are talking about can get implemented in ways that make the most sense for our producers. I want to thank everybody who's here tonight as well as those who are watching for your partnership which allows our land-grant university to rise to that original vision. We have one very simple purpose at our college we sustain life. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Kress. Joining Dean Kress this evening, we have some university representatives. Uh, we have Todd Davis, Assistant Extension Professor, Crop Economics and Management from the University of Kentucky. Jim Mentert, Director of Center for Commercial Agriculture from Purdue University. Tim Habb, De Department Chair for Agricultural, Environmental, and Developmental e Economics, The Ohio State University. We also have my supervisor, Kara Colvin. Uh, she's our new area leader for OSU Extension for this part of the state. And many, many of my OSU Extension colleagues that are here from uh, across the state, and we appreciate them being here, and those that are, are leading watch groups uh, in the rest of the state. So we thank you and appreciate all of you being here with us today. We're ready to move into the meat of the program. While you're all here, we have with us to moderate our program this evening, Ben Brown. You've heard me brag about him, uh, and I can't say enough good about the things that Ben does for all of us in, a in extension and for agriculture across the state. Does an awesome job. He holds his MS degree from in Applied Economics from the University of Missouri and his BS degree from Kansas State University in Agriculture Economics and Agronomy. Ben serves as the Program Manager for the Farm Management Program located in the Department of Agriculture, Environmental, and Developmental Economics at The Ohio State University. He's a native of Missouri. He grew up on a diversified crop farm and was very active in 4-H and FFA. Ben, let's make it happen. Excellent. Thank you, Sam. Appreciate it. <laughs> Well, thank you, everyone. It is a great day to study the economics of agriculture. Am I right? Yes. yes. Okay, good. I had in here hold for cheers and applause. So that's good. And then I had hold for louder cheers and applause. Anyways, so the truth is it really is a great day uh, to study the economics of agriculture. And it's great to be with each and every one of you here today in Dark County and with the hundreds of people that are joining us online from around the country. This really is a premier Farm Bill event for the United States, and we're excited to host it here in Ohio. Uh, this event started out with a couple of simple goals and a big dream. Uh, those, that goal was to bring universities, industry, and uh, government agencies together for the common purpose of educating and serving the producers and agribusinesses in the tri-state. Thanks to the partnership with Ohio AgNet, we are now serving producers and agribusinesses in 24 different states and five international countries. That is something to be very excited about, I think. That goal has continued to grow, um, and we also included a secondary goal, um, which was to involve the next generation of ag leaders um, to be a part of conversations around agriculture policy. And we're excited and welcome to have the FFA and 4-H members in attendance tonight. As you heard Mallory mention earlier, we believe in the future of agriculture. And my opinion is that the future of agriculture is increasingly bright and full of bright and talented young leaders uh, like the ones we saw today. It is not always the 
bring people to, easy to bring people together for an event like this. We were told multiple times that you can't bring all these groups together to do a common goal uh, because they couldn't set aside differences or they couldn't work together to leverage each other's strengths. But we made it happen, and we're excited, and we hope that this is a, the very beginning of a long and, and joyous partnership together. The dream was to be the best. Now, I don't know how you quantify being the best, but any video or any Farm Bill Summit that starts off with a hype video and has three great speakers like the ones we have today, I think certainly qualifies. The Farm Bill is a large, comprehensive bill. As we've learned already, there are areas in the research and credit titles which support the research done at Ohio State University, Purdue University, Kentucky University, and the other land-grant universities across the country. The credit title provides support for the farm credit system as well as farm service agency loans um, as we move forward. But the Farm Bill also touches um, farm programs to help mitigate against agriculture risk, conservation practices to conserve our national resources, aid to support uh, forestry, rural development, international markets um, for U.S. commodities, horticulture, and an animal disease preparedness and vaccine bank to protect against crippling diseases like African swine fever that we see going across Asia and Europe. The Farm Bill also provides assistance avoiding food insecurity in vulnerable populations, food waste, and malnutrition children. The Farm Bill literally touches all Americans, not just the farming population. Tonight our experts will touch on the commodities, conservation, and crop insurance titles. When you start planning for a program like this, you hope that you ask three great speakers, and maybe one of them will say yes. We got lucky that all three of our speakers said yes, and so I was very excited about that, and we're thrilled to have them here. A couple of logistics. Each of you should have had a note card on your table. Uh, we'll have our presenters speak tonight. If you have questions, feel free to write those questions down on the note card. We'll be collecting those at the end. And then we'll have a panel question for all the, or panel of, of our speakers um, for all the questions at the end. We will start tonight with the crop insurance title and Dr. Keith Coble from Mississippi State. Keith Coble is the Giles Distinguished Professor and Head of the Agriculture Economics Department at Mississippi State University, where he focuses on agriculture policy, insurance, and agriculture data analytics. Within his profession, Dr. Coble is the President-Elect of the American Agriculture and Applied Economics Association. Coble has published 90 scientific research journal articles, over 60 reports um, for government agencies, and 160 scientific conference papers. Over his academic career, Coble has received $9.8 million in grants and contracts. Coble served as the associate editor of the American Journal of Agriculture Economics from 2008 to 2001. Coble was the recipient of the Bruce Gardner Award from the U.S. Department of Agriculture Economics Group for his contribu contri contribution to the USDA policy analysis when he served as, the, uh, as a member of the Congressional uh, during the 2014 Farm Bill debate. He served as the chair of the Big Ag Data Committee for the Council of Food, Agriculture, and Resource Economics. He is also a member of the board of directors of the Ag Data Coalition, a nonprofit to help farmers control and manage their agriculture data. It's a great joy to have somebody of Dr. Cobral's standard here, and we, we welcome him to the stage. Thank you. As a proud alumni of the Up and At It 4-H Club of Van Zandt, Missouri, and a state FFA officer in the state of Missouri in 1977, I appreciate the involvement of that 4-H and the FFA today. Thank you so very much for inviting me to be a part of this uh, event today. Look forward to it. And so let's get started talking about a crop insurance when Ben gets my technology. Uh, in order. Thank you. All right. Another way to describe your three speakers tonight is you've got three old washed up hill staffers. Uh, I just want to begin with that. But again, as we look at this farm bill, I think there are a couple of things that we need to begin with. And um, I want to begin by pointing out something to you about the nature of getting this farm bill done. This is a diagram from the Pew Research Center that talks about the increasing partisanship in Washington, D.C. Uh, if you look over time, what we have seen 
is that there is greater and greater separation between the parties. There are fewer moderate Republicans. There are fewer conservative Democrats. Uh, I chuckled uh, about a year ago when Colin Peterson said, I'm the last blue dog Democrat left in uh, the House of Representatives, and it reminded me that I hadn't heard the term blue dog Democrat in a long, long time. I suspect if the Pew Research Center did another poll to compare to this one, that that gap continues to widen. And yet, we passed the Farm Bill last December. If you look at this, this act passed the House with 369 votes, it passed the Senate with 87 vo votes. To put it in context, the 2014 Farm Bill only got 66 votes in the Senate. So, Jonathan, they beat us by a long shot to put this together. The takeaway that I want to remind you of is this. That in a world of great partisanship in Washington, D.C., we passed a strongly bipartisan farm bill. And I attribute it primarily to one thing, and that is the alliance between farm groups and nutrition program supporters that was formed decades ago remains essential and bipartisan. There are disputes and there are struggles, but nonetheless, that alliance across the aisles has allowed a farm bill to get done in 2018 when there was an awful lot of reasons to think that it wouldn't happen, that it couldn't happen. And, and so let me just remind you that in, in one sense, agricultural policy, sometimes it's regional, but it is bipartisan by nature. And when it becomes partisan, it will be the end of doing what we have been doing, okay? Let's talk about crop insurance. And let me begin with a little bit of background about crop insurance. And let me note that I'm so old that I can remember when crop insurance wasn't done in the Farm Bill. Okay? I testified uh, before the ARPA in bill in 2000 uh, on the Hill because I was told crop insurance legislation is what we do when we're not doing farm bills. Pat remembers those days as well. In 94, we did legislation which was really significant in creating the modern crop insurance program. Uh, and, and ever since then, crop insurance is not only just in the Farm Bill, but it is a central part of the Farm Bill. Crop insurance and the Title I programs that Pat are going to talk about cannot be disentangled. They can't even be scored by the Congressional Budget Office without doing them simultaneously, okay? The other thing that I will mention is that in this modern era of agricultural policy, we have become increasingly market-oriented. Set-aside acres are not something that we talk about anymore and haven't for a long, long time. The thing that, that when I went up in 2013 and 14 and worked on the Farm Bill that struck me so much was that if you talked about a piece of policy as affecting or influencing how farmers manage risk, that was golden, okay? There were a few things that were claimed to be insurance that didn't quite pass my definition of insurance, but nonetheless, calling it insurance was helpful to getting it in the bill. In 2018, I saw no change in that dynamic. Risk was still the argument that made things happen in, in, in the Farm Bill. Another slide that I want to show you, this is, this is a, a survey that we did uh, early in 2018. Uh, Shay Gould, the lead author on this, was my undergraduate researcher, an outstanding uh, student in our department who is now a grad student in our department. Alba Collard, my colleague, and I helped her with this survey of U.S. adults in the United States, a representative survey, not of farmers, but of citizens in the United States. And, the, and we asked them to reallocate the budget of USDA, okay? 
in four broad categories, farm programs, conservation, uh, nutrition, and other, which captured a lot of different things. When you see what people uh, preferred, these are not just farmers, I remind you, this surprised me a little bit, is that the support for farm programs held steady. The support for conservation programs was really strong. People were shocked at the percent of the farm of USDA budget that was spent on nutrition programs. They want to spend less on it. By the way, if you explain to them more details about that, the, they still wanted to reduce it, but not as much. And the other category was a catch-all of a lot of things. I generally argue that it had to be research and extension in that other category that people wanted to plus up. Uh, I can't prove that, however. But anyway, that's part of the context uh, of, of doing this farm bill. And, the, and I think it will be part of the context for doing the next one. When we look at crop insurance programs, then what do we see? We Really, that 1995-96 era was fundamentally a game changer for crop insurance in the United States. What we see there is that we created the catastrophic coverage policy, which got a lot of people to come on into the program. Uh, we increased subsidies for the program. We got acres, and now today we have over 300 million acres in crop insurance programs, and our subsidy levels have, have essentially leveled off for some time. Uh, we built the program since then. The other thing that I will mention that obviously most of you know is that the introduction of revenue insurance uh, came along at the same time, which also made crop insurance much more uh, attractive to producers. Now this is a chart, and I actually continue to use the old chart to note that this was already expected before uh, the Farm Bill was even passed. It, the red line represents the expected payouts by the Congressional Budget Office for the ARC program. You see a decline there, a pretty steep one. You see the blue line reflecting the price loss coverage program. They're, they expected a, a switching from ARC to PLC after this farm bill. But what I really wanted to point out to you is the level of expenditure for crop insurance and where it is and where it's projected to be relative to the traditional Title I programs. Uh, it has far exceeded those in terms of farm bill expenditures and is expected to going forward. Uh, as I've already alluded to, revenue protection is the elephant in the room of crop insurance. We've tried some other things. Uh, in my part of the world, an 80% subsidized tax program didn't attract but about 30% of acres. Uh, a number of other uh, programs are out there, but the traditional old yield insurance policy is now down to 5% of the total book of business. Okay, As we look also, some of my favorite maps to show you are that average coverage levels for corn in 2018. Uh, here in this area and much of the Midwest, crop insurance coverage levels are 75% or, or above and you see in other areas, it's much lower. And, and uh, note that in Western states and places like uh, Arkansas, much lower and still a lot of cat coverage. A similar pattern when we look at soybeans, okay? So we have in this region, a very high coverage levels of crop insurance uh, that have been in play and, and been at that level for some time. When we look at irrigation, we see, of course, the irrigation liability share uh, of the business in a county dominates in the Plain States, dominates in uh, some of the irrigated regions of the South, and you can see the same kind of pattern for soybeans. Um, one of the newer parts of the crop insurance program are enterprise units. This is a map showing the percent of the liability in a county that is covered by enterprise units for corn. Uh, you can see how much in cert, uh, of the business now is covered by enterprise units. And one of the more significant things that got changed in this farm bill is that you can now do enterprise units across county lines. 
which will probably lead to an even higher percentage of enterprise units in our crop insurance program. And here's a similar kind of map for soybeans. Now, let me give you one more map, which is uh, differing risk levels in terms of base premium rates. Uh, this is what you see is low rates relative to the other part of the country in the Midwest because of the relatively low risk. You see higher rates in certain other areas. Uh, as you go across uh, regions of the country and different commodity groups, let me just remind you of one thing because I often get this question about the rating from one region to another. In general, the rates for a crop in a county are largely determined by the historical experience of that crop in that county, okay? So if you're grazing corn or soybeans in this county, then your rates are largely, not entirely, but largely determined by the experience of the program over the last 20 years in your home county, okay? Yep. Let me move on to subsidy per acre. And this is relevant to the part of the debate in the 2018 Farm Bill that I'll mention in just a moment. But you see the amount of subsidy per acre varies a great deal across the country. And that subsidy is a function of a number of factors. First, the value of the crop. Second, the riskiness of the crop. The coverage level that the farmer chose. And a number of other factors, type, practice, and things like that. Uh, and ultimately, this is the crop insurance subsidy level. And to tip my hand about what happened in the Farm Bill, it's the same subsidy schedule that we had in the 2014 Farm Bill. You see that the subsidy percentages, uh, which represent how much after the actuaries at USDA decide what the right premium rate for a, a policy is, this is how much they are subsidized, depending on basic versus optional and enterprise and SCO. Now, having said that, let me show you, this is one of the favorite things that I like to show people about the crop insurance program. Again, I mentioned earlier that we can divide the history, the modern history of crop insurance in the United States at 1995. You see the aggregate US level loss ratio bouncing up and down, and you see that loss ratio averaging at a much higher level in the 1980s, the early 1990s. In fact, when I did my dissertation uh, and was choosing a topic for it in about 1990, this is the question that we were asking. We, have, we had low participation in the crop insurance program and high loss ratios. How could those two things be going on together? What has happened since? We have had much lower loss ratios, we have had also, and it's not showing here, but much higher participation. Why is that? Well, I've heard lots of suggestions as to why. I think all of them are at least partially true. One is, I was living in Columbia, Missouri during the 1980 drought. I lived through the 1988 drought as well. Uh, we have had pretty good weather in the Midwest for a number of years. Uh, certainly there have been exceptions to that, but it's been nothing like the 1980s. Certainly we brought a whole lot more people into the program and actuaries will talk to you about the fact that we have a better risk pool. We bought people on into the crop insurance program and we have also changed our production systems. The technology that we're using, the, the seed varieties that you're planting, the production systems that you have are all likely better than they were. And it's a better crop insurance program. Better data, better rates, better underwritings than it was at that time. So all these things together. And to be honest with you, one of the most common questions I get asked from reporters is, well, how's climate changing affecting crop insurance? Climate change has got to be driving up the losses in the crop insurance program. And the answer is, I can't see it in the data yet, okay? And my, the, my general answer is, it looks to me like it, to date, we're outrunning climate change. Uh, we, we may not 
run, outrun climate change forever, but we have been. So all of this is precursor to talking about the 2018 Farm Bill and the crop insurance title. What I'm going to do now is in my next slide, I'm going to give you a list of all the big changes that happened to crop insurance in the 2018 Farm Bill. Here it is. Memorize it. Okay? It is amazingly short list in terms of what I would define as big changes to the crop insurance program. I think the more relevant question to ask is what didn't happen? And when we look at that, we had serious proposals to cap subsidies at $40,000 per farm. We had serious proposals to apply AGI limits to crop insurance benefits. We had very serious proposals to remove or unsubsidize the harvest price option in revenue protection. And we had serious proposals to reduce the subsidy percentage on the crop insurance program. None of those things happened, okay? So, since that didn't happen, what is the media talking about with respect to crop insurance? Well, here it is. Thanks to Adobe, I was able to count how many times the word hemp showed up in the farm bill and the conference language. 114 times, including hemp insurance, all right? As I was driving down the road, uh, a few weeks ago, I started thinking about, okay, we've got so many people interested in hemp, growing hemp, insuring hemp, uh, all the different possible uses for it, and knowing the ingenuity of American farmers, I think we're going to have a huge supply of hemp pretty soon. And since I live next door to the great state of Alabama, it struck me that we're going to have to find some new uses for hemp when it's all said and done. And I, rem I was reminded of my favorite Alabama movie, about Forrest Gump and his good friend Benjamin Buford Bubba Blue, and we may have to find some new uses for hemp, uh, as, as Bubba was able to do with shrimp. Okay, being more serious about it, there are some things that people are talking about in this bill in terms of uh, research projects were, that were mandated in the bill. You can see, and not surprising, issues about tropical storm and hurricanes, uh, various uh, minor crops in terms of the size and volume, uh, interesting new uh, technologies, interest for uh, studies on subsurface irrigation practice, local food producers, and things like that. So that's really kind of the story when it comes to what's new in, in the Farm Bill. So let's talk about the uh, kind of where we're at today and looking forward. One of the very interesting things to me, and I'm going to throw this out, and I will, be, uh, I will admit to you, these numbers surprise me. And I don't have a good answer to explain them. Uh, I've included rice and cotton as a point of reference, but most of you I know are interested in corn and soybeans. So for 2019, the projected prices for corn and soybeans in Ohio, and then rice and cotton for the south, here are the projected price levels, uh, $4 on corn, $9.54 on soybeans. You care a lot about what those were. Remember that the crop insurance projected price is driven by the futures market. So whatever the harvest month contract is trading for early in the year before the sign-up deadline is going to drive those numbers. But here's the point that I really want to make. It's the far right column, which is price volatility. And there I find something rather interesting, and that is that even though we're in a trade war with China, dealing with tariffs and so forth, these price volatility levels, which plug into your revenue insurance rates, these are remarkably low. Okay? I personally would have expected that the soybean price volatility would be at least 18%. I wouldn't have been surprised if it was 20%, 22% but it was at 12% as low as rice, and, and that's a very low level, okay? If we talk also about the, the program, there's a couple more things I want to point out. A grad student of mine is working on a study right now looking at the overlap between ARC program and yield and revenue insurance, and we see that producers in this part of the world pay a lot of money to buy overlapping coverage. 
but our analysis suggests that they are rational to do so, uh, even though it's relatively costly. Because of the subsidy schedule, when you go to those higher coverage levels, you're also paying more for all your other coverage as well. Okay? Let me make another point. There, a lot of people are suggesting that in the new sign-up for Title I programs, that they'll, we'll see a lot of farmers, especially in corn, switch to PLC. It's going to differ. It's going to provide price-only protection rather than a layer of ARC protection. I think you all need to get your mindset in thinking about ARC and PLC are different. Now, if you just want to estimate which one's going to pay you the more, you can do that. But in terms of risk protection, they provide something very different. And so I did this little example here for a farm that averaged 160 bushel yield and $4 on corn. What is PLC going to do? It's going to pay against low price scenarios. What does revenue protection do? You can see the green cells here are reflecting when revenue pay, uh, protection payments are going to occur and you're going to have uh, either low yield or low price causing those events. And then ultimately, when you put those together and add them to your market revenue, you get some kind of curious things going on. In extremely low price scenarios, you're getting a lot of double protection. And that's a different scenario than you would have had with ARC. Okay? Few more side notes that I want to make, and that is number one, a, a phenomenon that again is curious to me. When we see these different coverage levels across different regions of the country, the one thing that is rather constant is very few of you farmers in the room appear to be willing to pay more than 4% of the expected value of your crop in producer paid premium payments. I have no idea why 4% seems to be the boundary, okay? I'm going to try to study that some more, but right now it seems to be a pretty good estimate of where you are going to stop paying more for your insurance. Another point that I want to make, here's an example and actually a map from Indiana. Going forward, crop insurance rating is going to change and it's going to change dramatically. And it's going to be big data that causes it. And as you all know, in recent years, you've had to report your CLUs, which means your insurance unit is going to be well identified to its geolocation. And what that's going to allow is a lot more precise nature of rating, and it's going to make the rates more accurate within county lines. And this is the result of a study that we did at Mississippi State that supports that that will have a positive effect on increasing the accuracy of, of rates. Here's a study that I did that I found rather interesting and, and we published it recently, but, but we did it before the Farm Bill was done. A lot of people were talking about the changes in crop insurance and will, an, an argument was being made that large farmers are less risky and if they leave the crop insurance program, the, the riskiness of the pool is going to change. I was rather dubious of that. We did some analysis and what we found is essentially the same result on corn and soybean. And yes, we did find that a, an insured unit that was a part of a very large farm was less risky than an insured unit that was a part of a small farm. I don't have the answer why. And I will remind you that this result is mitigated when you have revenue insurance, which, which dampens the effect that I'm talking about here. Let, my, let me end by making a few more points. One is, as I showed with the crop insurance and the uh, PLC overlap, real risk management on the farm today is going to involve a lot of different forms of risk management. Financial management, cost control, integrating your crop insurance, your farm program, and forward pricing and ultimately the ability to keep the data and do the records so that you can see what worked and what did not. I'm going to throw in a slide. I know it's past sales closing dates here in Ohio, but this is a slide that I suggest to people now in terms of crop insurance. Questions that you ought to ask your crop insurance agent if you have never asked them. Crop insurance agents don't, don't always like for me to show this slide because it slows them down, and I understand that. 
But now you should be asking about can you do enterprise units across county lines? Can you qualify for trend adjusted yields? Uh, do you qualify for the APH yield exclusions? What about a different coverage level? And what about separate coverages by practices? Let me end with this slide. Number one is we see a lot of flooding that has occurred in 2019. We've got a lot of rain. We may have some late planting in some regions of the country. And there's also a lot of discussion about ad hoc disaster legislation. One of the things that I would say to you is that when I began working on crop insurance policy, the number one argument to enhance, to build, to add subsidy to the crop insurance program was to do away with ad hoc disaster bills. And for several years, we didn't do ad hoc disaster bills. It looks like we're about to get back into doing crop insurance and ad hoc disaster bills. Um, I'm not sure that I think that's good policy, but that's where we're headed. And we know that we've got some losses like these grain bins we were talking today. Uh, is that grain and that bin insured? Uh, not by crop insurance, it's not. And so we're going to be having some conversations about that going forward. And it's going to be interesting to see the path forward with all of this. So with that, I'm going to shut down and turn it over to my two fellow speakers. Great. Ben? Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Koble. Uh, reminder, questions will be collected on the note cards. Um, if you hold them up uh, when you have them, Sam and, and some of the FFA members will be around to pick them up. If you have questions, uh, we'll ask them of the panelists at the end. Um, we also want to give special recognition. Uh, we didn't do this earlier, and we meant to. Uh, so that great video uh, that, you sh that you saw at the beginning, we want to give proper recognition to that. Um, that was done with our Delaware Extension educators, um, Rob Leeds, Kenzie Johnson, and Rachel. They're here uh, with us if you guys want to give a wave. We do appreciate it. Um, it was a great video, and, and we appreciate their work and support on that. So our second speaker tonight will touch on the conservation title. As a man that grew up here in this area, his family resides here in our attendance tonight, and we're excited to have him back. Um, producers rely on the programs held within the conservation title to help make them, their farms more resilient and productive. Programs like the Conservation Stewardship Program and Environmental Quality Incentives Program provide the technical and financial resources for producers to improve the soil health, water quality, and wildlife habits on the surrounding lands around their operation. Programs like Conservation Reserve Program help retire environmentally sensitive land from agriculture production to reestablish valuable land cover, improving water quality, preventing soil erosion, and the reduction of wildlife habit. The conservation title in the Farm Bill was more contentious than usual this time around, um, and it's probably setting up structural changes to see in future discussions. As mentioned, Jonathan Coppice um, is a native of Dark County. He is the author of The Fault of the Fault Lines of Farm Policy, A Legislative and Political History of the Farm Bill. I have my copy, I'm hoping to get him to sign it. Um, and is on faculty at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Previously, he served as Chief Counsel on the Senate Agriculture of, Committee of Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry, a Minister of the Farm Service Agency at USDA, and Legislative Assistant to Senator Ben Nelson. Jonathan grew up on his family farm in Western Ohio, earned his bachelor's from Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, and his Juris Doctor from George Washington University Law School in Washington, D.C. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome back to Western Ohio, Jonathan Coppice. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. All right. As uh, Dr. Coble reminded me, you can't go home again, but we'll, we'll try not to uh, let that get in the way of this evening's presentation. I want to first off, I want to thank Ben and Sam and everybody for bringing me back home for a short stay and a chance to talk to everybody and see some familiar faces and, of course, some familiar turf. Uh, I'm going to talk about the conservation title, uh, but, uh, you know, old habits die hard, so you might notice I'm making a bit of an argument through this presentation, so I'm going to blend in a couple things like history and maybe a little bit of politics, so bear with me as we, as we go through it, but uh, we're going to talk policy, farm bill, and... Um, Politics. So Dr. Coble kind of tipped, tipped uh, started this discussion off. Uh, farm bill, uh, written in very polarized times. This is the 2018 uh, House 
midterm election results as reported by the New York Times. We know this very familiar red and blue map. Uh, as Dr. Koble mentioned, and as many of you know, the Farm Bill was a very bipartisan final vote count. So this is an accomplishment that uh, we should take some pride in, and we should also uh, take some moments to think through and learn some of the uh, lessons that we get out of this to, re to achieve something that's bipartisan that is a massive piece of legislation that spends roughly a trillion dollars over 10 years and touches, as has been mentioned, about every life in this country. Uh, to pull this off in this kind of environment was no easy task. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, another way to look at the electoral map, and I'm not sure why the words come up like that, but this is the 2016 presidential election uh, map by Princeton University. This is a fun 3D map that will rotate and all kinds of neat stuff. But basically the size of the tower is representative of uh, the number of voters. And so this is also something we know in the political realm uh, from agriculture is the tough political realities when we start counting votes in Congress across urban and rural uh, uh, sectors of the country. And how have we done this? As mentioned, we've built a coalition over many, many years, and we have worked very hard to maintain it at times uh, as political pressures have worked to almost tear it apart. And that, that coalition is really a three-part uh, coalition. It's the farm coalition, the regional interests around farm support policy. It is the food assistance coalition, uh, the supplemental nutrition assistance program that provides food assistance to low-income families to feed themselves and their families. And of course, the environmental conservation side of this uh, that I'll talk about in more detail in the conservation title. And if we look back over history, right, the, the, this starts with the Farm Coalition in the 20s. We add food assistance in the 60s and really get around to conservation policy in the 80s. And uh, since that time, this is how we've been able to pull off relatively strong bipartisan efforts in Congress. This uh, is from the Congressional Budget Office. This is uh, our national debt as a percentage of GDP, looking back over the entire history of the United States. And as you can tell, we have ourselves a bit of debt. Uh, this is not a new issue and this is not a new uh, topic and I promise I'm not going to get into a budget or debt discussion in any kind of detail. But what I do want to use is to set up something. And it is th the budget issues and the budget challenges that are, that are really operating in our political space that are changing the ability to write legislation. It changes how we write legislation and it really complicates the politics as we go through. If we look at a farm bill, it was mentioned kind of where spending uh, takes place out of the farm bill. Uh, this looks back, Congressional Research Service put together this wonderful uh, chart a while back that looks at about 25 years of spending in the farm bill. And we can see over time the significant growth uh, in the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, the SNAP program, or it used to be called food stamps, largely coming out of the 2008 recession when many people lost jobs or lost income. And so that counter-cyclical type program grew. We can see, as, as Dr. Koba pointed out, the big growth in crop insurance in the blue bars. We see the up and down uh, spending on the red bar part of the bar from Title I commodity programs. And then we see this steady incline over time uh, in conservation spending. And so these are the trends that we saw coming into this farm bill uh, and that we have been monitoring or dealing with as we go through an increasingly difficult political environment that is complicated more and more by budget challenges. Let's step back a little bit more. What about the history of the Farm Bill? This is, a, this is my attempt at graphs. So as a lawyer, I, I, working with a bunch of economists, they force me to do graphs. And so every once in a while, I have to make some. So here's my attempt to chart the market year average price for cotton, corn, and wheat for the entire 100-year history of, uh, of the Farm Bill, looking, and then adding the years looking ahead by the Congressional Budget Office. So we can see sort of the low price run that got us there in the Great Depression that really is the origin story of farm policy and the farm bill. Uh, the New Deal legislation of 1933 in the depths of that depression, but farmers had actually been suffering depression issues for going on 12 years or so prior to that. And of course, conservation policy is also, uh, also originates at this point in time, although we really don't get around to a major conservation policy until the 80s, but the Dust Bowl, uh, the, the just tragic uh, Dust Bowl disaster of the 30s, also wraps into some of how we develop and begin writing farm bills in this country. And so this, this run of, of, of struggle and challenge in the 30s, we look to quite a bit as we talk about how the policy got started and what its roots look like, but also what are the lessons we pull out of, of how we got to where we are today. So building conservation policy. This is looking at the CRP. Ben mentioned the CRP, the Conservation Reserve Program. This is our longest running 
conservation policy. Um, we can trace the title of it all the way back to the 1956 Farm Bill. It is uh, tied a little bit to what we were doing in the 30s and early 40s during the, uh, the post-Dust Bowl realm. But it's really 1985's Farm Bill in which we create, recreated the CRP program and designed it specifically to take environmentally sensitive land out of production. So before 85, this program was largely kind of a, a, a component of price support policy. So we had loans out there trying to help support prices and we would use uh, conservation as one of the ways we'd pull acreage out of production and pay farmers to do so. The policy today as it stood uh, going into this farm bill and remain coming out of this farm bill is, is a land retirement policy. 10 to 15 year contracts that takes those acres out of production and uh, in return you get an annual rental payment from USDA. And uh, the 2014 farm bill capped this program at 24 million acres. So this map was reported by FSA uh, where those acres sat um, going into the farm bill. The other land retirement policy that we've created over time that is not part of CRP but is also out there and available are the easements. Where you can put a, you can have a permanent legal right on the property uh, that, that places an easement right on the property to do conservation. In particular in the picture here uh, dealing with wetlands. You can get an easement uh, that will help you restore and maintain wetlands on your property. Uh, groups like Ducks Unlimited and other uh, wildlife groups really are interested in programs like this to help restore habitat. Uh, and this is one way to make sure that habitat is not only restored on your property, but is maintained uh, going forward because the easement is a, uh, a right in that land that will run with the land and each sub subsequent owner will buy with that easement on it. If we look at uh, how we sort of um, added more conservation layers in the 80s, we can think of a challenge coming out of uh, budget issues, particularly coming out of the 70s and the Reagan administration in the 80s that was looking to cut spending. Again, we can see in the debates around this time the way that budget fight really complicated our politics. But at the same time, we were dealing with the farm crisis of the 80s, and we were dealing with uh, a massive amount of, of expansion in planted acres in the 70s, which returned erosion concerns. At the same time in our political realm, we saw a growth in the environmental movement and political power around things like the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Environmental Protection Agency, all created in the 70s. So by the time we got to the 1985 Farm Bill, we were struggling mightily on the farm. Our politics were struggling mightily, mightily with budget and spending issues and some difficult political environment. And uh, we formed up the remaining part of our coalition by bringing in the environmental interest through the Conservation Reserve Program, as well as conservation compliance. So in 85, we created CRP. And as part of that deal, we added compliance. And I presume most of you in this room know what compliance is, but just to give it a brief overview, in order to be eligible for any payment under the USDA programs, you, your farm, has to be in compliance with two things. One of them is highly erodible lands. If that acreage is highly erodible, you must have a plan in place to control erosion on those acres. That is to protect that soil and keep it out of our waters and protect our waters as well. If you do not have that compliant, if you do not have your plan in place for highly erodible land, you are out of compliance and that needs to be addressed. You uh, will be ineligible for payments. And in fact, if you've been out of compliance for multiple years, you may owe money back for any payments you've received in that time frame. In a similar vein, wetlands compliance also added in 85, extended in 1990, uh, deals with whether or not the acreage on your farm was a wetland at any point in time. Now it's grandfathered usually from 1990, anything that was drained before 1990. After that point in time, if it was a wetland, you cannot farm on a, on a, a drained wetland and you cannot drain a wetland or you become ineligible. These are major, major provisions in dealing with our farm programs and assistance. And I think it's also very notable that we saw these provisions come about in the fights of the 80s that this was part of that deal to build the coalition broader and strengthen our ability to get through Congress in the 80s. So we can see some of the way this policy develops around the challenges that we see. What we've been developing, particularly in the, the more market-oriented years since 1996, is this idea of working lands conservation. So the CRP program takes acres out of production. Well, what we've also found is we need to be working with assistance on producing farms that's not taking acres out of production. So we began creating uh, working lands environmental or working lands conservation programs, beginning with the Environmental Quality Incentives Program or EQIP, 
Uh, this is an attempt to show uh, the acres in the program as well as the uh, obligations as reported by USDA. So you can see some of the growth around this program. It's designed as cost share. This is the program where you go into the NRCS office and you can sign up for assistance, direct assistance to help offset the cost of, a, of putting in place a conservation practice. It has, uh, the farmer of course is gonna pay the remaining amount of that. This has so far been significantly focused on livestock production. For the, those of you with livestock in the, uh, on your farm, this has been a program using uh, federal funds to help uh, improve manure management, for example. Uh, it helps put in grass waterways and other kind of conservation practices uh, where, the sh where the share of it is uh, offset, but the farm stays in production. A similar working lands policy is the CSP program, and this one got a little bit more attention and caused some of the controversy and challenges in this last, in the 2018 Farm Bill. Again, we're looking at acres and obligations as reported by NRCS. The Conservation Stewardship Program, or CSP, is working lands but across the entire farm and rather than just cost share it is an annual contract payment so you're going to go into nrcs and sign up for this program you have to achieve a certain level of conservation to get into the program to qualify and then you're in for five years and every year you're each of those five years you're receiving an annual contract payment from nrcs in return for maintaining the conservation that got you into the program and improving it across the entire farm now that obviously can be a very complex process. And of course, the paperwork can be no small amount of challenge. But we're looking to see conservation on working lands that extends beyond individual practices but touches the entire farm. One of the things that we've seen as a big challenge of this program is that uh, in dealing with lease land, of course, if you lose that lease or how you work across multiple landlords, there have been attempts to uh, improve that at the agency level and in the 2018 Farm Bill. I think more remains to be seen on how that's gonna work but it is a challenge in a program of, uh, with this uh, uh, type of policy goal and the level of complexity that we work through. So look, we had conservation in the 80s at a time when we're in the middle of farm crisis but struggling politically as well. And these conservation pressures have not decreased. We continue to see them. In fact, I would say they're growing. Conservation pressures now uh, we're seeing expand from things like consumers and concerns throughout the food chain. Do we see sustainable production? Can I guarantee that the food that I buy has been produced in a way that's sustainable or that meets certain criteria uh, from what I want to see uh, in the production side of that? Everything from the water quality issues at the Gulf of Mexico, from drainage issues, from nutrient soil loss, uh, on and on and on. Uh, issues that we know we're very familiar with in Ohio. Right? So these pressures are not just new but they are certainly not going away. In fact, they are growing and are gonna to continue to drive much of the political and policy discussion as we work on farm bills. So as we think about the programs that we have that interact with farmers in this farm bill, this is the total base acres that receive payments from the Title I program, as reported by FSA, as be discussed by Dr. Westhoff. Here's crop insurance with that growth into the 300 million acre category. There's conservation. And this is not to pick on conservation, but this is to highlight where we're spending our money and the acres that we are impacting uh, in these programs as compared to the political pressures that we have for a farm bill. Now we've mentioned budget and spending issues. The Congressional Budget, Congressional budget Office, CBO, is our scorekeeper in Congress. They're the ones that tell us what they think programs are gonna spend and complicating the politics around passing a bill and the challenges of drafting legislation is this idea that CBO is going to tell us what we're going to spend in a series of programs over 10 years. That becomes a baseline that we have to work with. And then any changes we want to make in the legislative process have to be offset. So if I want to spend more on conservation programs, I will have to cut from something else. If I want to spend more on Title I programs, I have to cut somewhere else. And so it sets up this tough zero-sum kind of game in the political realm in which interest groups now are not just disagreeing about policy, but those disagreements may come with real uh, consequences in the programs and the spending. So what did the 2018 Farm Bill end up doing in conservation? Well, a couple things that may be good and a few things that raise some real concerns. Right? The CRP and the easement programs, Agriculture Conservation Easement is ASEP, the spending on those programs have, has increased, at least as the way CBO looks at it going forward. 
They've done so because we've increased acreage in CRP. We've stepped up from the 24 million acre cap over the five-year life of this bill to eventually 27 million acres that can be in CRP. But watch this. In order to pay for that, we had to cut rental rates. So this time, CRP rental rates are now capped at 85% of the county average rental rate for general sign-up and 90% for the continuous sign-up. This is likely to impact not just CRP uh, sign-up, but where those acres exist, because clearly this will push uh, CRP dollars into acres that are, or I shouldn't say clearly, my guess is this is gonna push uh, CRP dollars into acres that are less expensive. We did see some provisions added in to really focus some assistance, particularly continuous assistance, on water quality for lakes, for estuaries, for rivers, through the continuous and the, and the uh, conservation reserve enhancement programs trying to focus, again, some of this assistance back into the working land categories and back on the water quality challenges that we are really dealing with here in the Midwest. We also increased easement funding. So the increases that we've seen in this farm bill were largely on the side of acres in the, as largely on the side of the acreage retirement programs and CRP and easements. Different story for working lands programs. The House Farm Bill uh, proposed eliminating the CSP program altogether and somehow blending it in with the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. The Senate pro Farm Bill did not do that. When they worked it out in conference, we have kind of a typical, typical compromise where we've sort of eliminated CSP by moving all the authorities under EQIP. But what may be more important with the change here is that these programs, where CSP used to be an acreage-based program, so each year USDA was instructed to add 10 million acres roughly to the program. Now it sits in one pot of money with EQIP and we're dividing that money across the two programs. It is no longer operating on an acreage basis. So that, I don't know exactly how that's gonna change the sign up or how the program operates, but it certainly raises some concerns about what are the implications for revising this program in this way and putting it under the same pot of money as EQIP. Overall, based on CBO scoring, it looks like we're reducing the funding in working lands conservation to some level. Also uh, included in this working lands category is the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, which we added in 2014. And this one is a new acronym and sort of a new program, but the, really the way it works is on a regional basis across farms, but also across the different working lands title programs. So it uses CSP and EQIP authorities. And this will help, I think, expand or extend some of the funding for working lands. But ultimately, this raises questions. This raises concerns not just about the investment we're making into something as important, both uh, to people, to farmers, and on the ground, but also to those that do not farm that look at uh, our farm practices and ask questions or want to see more sustainability. How are we managing the investment to do that? Well, I borrowed these from uh, uh, Dr. Newton uh, with uh, American Farm Bureau. He put out a neat article just recently about EQIP and CSP that's comparing the two programs, and he put together these maps showing where the acres exist, so you can see Ohio here at roughly 325 uh, million, or 325,000 acres in CSP and 96 in EQIP, right? So now we have these two programs as a single source of funding. We've also added language in there, will allow uh, irrigation districts to compete for that funding, which is gonna challenge, I think, uh, some of the availability. And it raises a very significant concern, speaking in the Midwest from the Midwest, I think it raises a concern for us in the Midwest. What is this going to do to the conservation investment on our farms in this part of the country? How is this going to play out? And what is the impact as we're also uh, struggling with things like water quality challenges? In a similar vein, we look at the funding uh, map comparison. You can see again uh, where, where the funds have been divvied up or allocated, I should say, where the funds have been allocated to the states uh, using this map. And so we're going to be watching closely how this works. So the big announcement recently uh, is that NRCS is now taking applications for CSP. So this is a moment uh, when farmers can go in and sign up for the program, see if they qualify. Applications are open until May the 10th. And what they have announced is not major changes, at least that, that I can tell in how the program's gonna operate, other than uh, there's no basic change in the, in the payment range, so that we see an increase for cover cropping and for resource conserving crop rotation. So if you're thinking about those kind of practices, get into your NRCS office and ask about what's available and see if your farm can qualify and get in this program. If for no other reason we want to certainly see uh, an increase in demand for this kind of assistance, uh, particularly from the Midwest, and help to offset any challenges that changes in the bill might result in. So 
if we take a moment again to kind of place our current discussion, coming back into my argument a little bit more, how have we dealt with conservation and these challenges with natural resources over time? Well, I've mentioned a, a few of these, right? We know that in the Dust Bowl era, uh, we had massive problems, largely concentrated in the Western Plains, and the stories coming out of the Dust Bowl are, are difficult and hard to imagine the level of challenge that we had. The policy response largely was taking acres out of production. Uh, the response was trying to pay farmers to reseed those acres that had been plowed up for wheat. As we expanded acres again in the 70s, uh, in the 70s, largely during the target price era, uh, post the big spike with uh, early 1970s changes in both monetary policy and trade policy. We saw expanded acres, a push for farmers to increase the acres they controlled, you know, the old get big or get out, the fence row to fence row mentality that we saw in the Nixon administration in the 70s, resulting uh, or largely leading up to the crisis in the 80s and this return of erosion challenges and this return of CRP and acreage reduction policy, as well as the addition of compliance policy on farmers. And I still say this is an incredibly significant uh, moment in history when you think of that during the depths of the farm crisis that, our, that Congress agreed in policy to uh, put, those, uh, put those payments on an eligibility basis determined by conservation. So as farmers were in the middle of the crisis, we changed policy and added compliance. So this is, gives you an idea of just how big the political move and how important that coalition was at the time. So as we step into current era, we're in this RFS era, if you will, this time of, again, expanded acres, expanded pro production, very large crops with the genetic engineered seeds and our ability to, to uh, uh, produce more and more that we need, even with an RFS, a renewable fuel standard in place. And what we're seeing now is another massive natural resource challenge, and that's water quality. I, I'm standing in Ohio, I need to talk too much about water quality challenges. We think of Western Lake Erie and the struggles uh, with the community like Toledo and the politics and, and challenges around uh, water quality. And think about the story that, that sort of reverberates in the, in the discussions around this country when we think about large communities that have to buy water because they can't drink the water coming out of the lake. These things cause us real problems they also cause us real political problems. And they raise the question about how are we gonna deal with, with conservation challenges in this era of this scale. But more importantly, when it was the Dust Bowl, these were acres that we'd put into production that we took out of production. In the nutrient loss era, we're talking about some of the most productive fertile farmland in the world. We're talking about high, uh, high cost, expensive farmland, much of it tile drained, that's losing this, these, nitrogen, these nutrients. This is not the same conservation challenge as the Dust Bowl. So are, are, are our policies up to the task? And do we need to rethink these a little bit and start thinking through not just conservation, but a more complete risk picture, if you will? What do we know is, is the big driving, you know, the, the topic du jour of the 2014 Farm Bill that was, the, was the issue of risk, and 2018 is the issue of risk. That part of the conversation is not gonna change. We're gonna continue to hear concerns about risk, and we're gonna to continue to watch as we not only deal with weather risk, but climate risk. Risk to yields, but the nutrient challenge that we have. How do our policies adapt to that? We look at yield loss, we, we think about crop insurance and the incredible work we've done over time to build that program up, to get high participation in most of the major commodities, and to see actuarial soundness and policies that work uh, for the farmer but also in times like we've seen with good years, good crop years, when that spending comes down because we're not seeing the loss at the farm level, this is a program that adjusts to the risks and the realities. How do we think about that when we deal with something uh, of the scale and scope of say the Gulf hypoxic zone, which is driving policy changes in Illinois right now where we see a big push for nutrient loss reduction for the last four to five years. We've seen farmers trying to find and adapt and adopt new practices to cut that nutrient loss as this pressure comes up out of the Gulf, and I would also add from local communities. We saw a lawsuit in Iowa, uh, in Des Moines, over drainage districts, that was, and another one that was just filed recently. So we will start to see these challenges build and build and build, and we need policy that adapts to those challenges and thinks of it in terms of risk. Why? So here's my other attempt uh, to the economists in the room. This is my attempt to, to do a little economics work. Bear with me. Right? If this is the value of our corn, 
uh, revenue value, yield, and price, our operating costs, our overhead costs, well, you can start to see the underwater challenges, right? If we add conservation costs on top of that, we're now adding challenges to that farmer, particularly at a time when we're dealing with revenue uh, risk as well, right? We're complicating this picture for the farmer trying to do the policies we need to see uh, on the larger, uh, the larger space uh, on water, on politics. We may be putting these farmers at a competitive disadvantage. This might be an investment. If it's an investment in soil health, it might be one that's going to take time to pay off. How does that farmer compete on, say, cash rent with somebody who's willing to pay more for cash rent in a, in a time when you're struggling to, uh, to make ends meet to begin with? What happens in that situation where you've spent three or four years uh, trying to build up that soil health and you lose the rent, you lose the lease, right? These challenges not only complicate uh, the policy, but they complicate our real world actions. So what happens in those cases? How do we think about our policies that deal with these realities of working lands and farm production and farm risk? I wish I had that answer, I don't. But I think if we started to look at our farm bill and particularly the three buckets that deal with farmers directly, here's our spending bars. Uh, as reported by CBO back in January, the red bars are Title I program payments. You'll see the spike uh, dealing with the market facilitation program that came out because of the tariff and trade. So we see a massive spike in spending there. We see our crop insurance in blue and our spending and conservation there in green. Set aside the dollars for a second. What else do you see here? You see three different programs, three different acronyms operated by three different agencies within USDA, largely serving the same farmers. Can we begin to think of policies that think of conservation, not just in natural resource issues, but also in terms of the price or revenue risk that the farmer faces and the challenges in the, in the management side of that question, the financial management of that farm? Can we start to think across these bars and think of ways that these two programs or these three areas can work together better? Can we think of insurance payments, and I know this can make some of us nervous, given the experience with conservation compliance, but can we think outside of the compliance bucket and start to think about how our insurance and our farm program payments better blend in conservation as we go, that we're helping with that competitive disadvantage that some of these farmers may be facing, or that we're helping with the short-term investment challenges that might come with that. And if I wanted to be provocative, I'd ask this question, because I've gotten asked this question. With all this money spent on farmers, What's the return on investment for the taxpayer? What are we doing outside of the farmer? Where, if I'm not in farming, where do I see the most return on the money spent? Is it in crop insurance? Is it in farm programs? Or is it in conservation? Do these sort of questions help drive us to rethink some of our policies and push forward, because it's never too early to start thinking about the next farm bill, about how we might start pushing some of these discussions and maybe, maybe just maybe working across those titles. That's my argument. I'll stick with it for at least a little bit longer. I'll also make a shameless plug for the book that I put out. If you really like history and farm bills, um, it came out in uh, December. It's from University of Nebraska Press. And you know, if, if you really want to run through 100 years of farm bill history, here it is, uh, the fault line. So listen, thanks again, Ben and Sam and everybody for having me back. And I uh, look forward to the questions here in a little bit. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jonathan. Our final speaker for this evening is someone that without him, I likely would not be doing what I'm doing today. Dr. Pat Westoff is the man who signed the signature that may, allowed me to pass with my master's degree from the University of Missouri, and I am forever in his debt. Um, it was a struggle. I don't, I, there was a period where we didn't know whether I was going to graduate, right? Yes. So anyways, but I have long been impressed with his understanding and education of all the titles, but especially the work he and the rest of the team at the Food and Agriculture Policy Research Institute do in the commodity title. Depending on how farm commodity program is defined, programs have existed since the, 19, or since the late 1700s. From that time, federal legislation allowed reduced price and free land to people who wanted to settle and farm it in the western part of the United States during the Homestead Act under President Lincoln. Early federal farm policy focused primarily on education, research, and some market assistance, and thus the creation of the federal cooperative extension programs offered at our land-grant institutions. 
During the Great Depression era, commodity programs were designed to support prices and income through the use of supply controls. These programs continued until 1996 with the Freedom to Farm Act shifted policy to more market-oriented systems and increased planting flexibility. These programs continued until the 2014 Farm Bill when direct payments were replaced with the Agriculture Risk Coverage Program and the Price Loss Coverage Programs. Within the tri-state area, there were 242,000 farms, FSA farms, that signed up for programs under the commodity title in the 2014 Farm Bill. That's almost a quarter of a million farms. The 2018 Farm Bill provided fewer changes to the commodity title than its predecessor, the 2014 Farm Bill, with maybe one exception in the dairy program. Enrollment was low under the margin protection program for the dairy producers as costs were high and protection was low. The new margin coverage program included in the 2018 Farm Bill reduces premiums, recalculates the feed cost formula, and gives priority to the first 5 million pounds of milk, helping many of our dairy producers in the tri-state area. Dr. Pat Westhoff is the director of the Food and Ag Policy Research Institute at the University of Missouri and the Howard Cawden Professor of Agriculture and Applied Economics. He grew up on a farm in Iowa, has degrees from the University of Iowa and the University of Texas, and obtained his PhD in Agriculture Economics from Iowa State University. He served in the Peace Corps in Guatemala and was an economist within, with the U.S. Senate Ag Committee um, before joining the University of Missouri in 1996. Again, this is one of my favorite people, somebody that I have high respect for, and I'd ask you to welcome Dr. Pat Westhoff to the stage. Thank you, sir. Appreciate the right there. Thanks a lot, Ben, for the kind invitation. Thank you all for being here tonight. I was in Washington, D.C. on Monday and Tuesday. I'd say I much prefer being here to being in Washington, D.C. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about a variety of topics tonight. But we're going, to, we're going to kick off by talking a bit about some of the finer points of the Farm Bill. What are some of the major provisions in the Farm Bill? What changed, what didn't change from last time around? We'll talk about the ARC ELC, uh, PLC election process in great detail if we can, and some big picture perspective if we have time at the end. But first and most importantly, why Ben Brown is here as opposed to being someplace else, like, say, the University of Missouri. So we do a test of our employees, see how good they are doing prognosticating. So we took a national survey to you know, have, have them checked. I have one employee scored in the top one percentile. I have made the top 10 percentile. And some other folks have been not just a bit below that. You see, Ben was in the 54th percentile. Now, we don't like just average folks in the University of Missouri. That, of course, was the ESPN tournament challenge for the basketball tournament I just completed here recently. All right. So what's, uh, what files are going to be based on my reading of the 2018 Farm Bill? I'm not a lawyer, as Jonathan Kappas will remind me. My wife will remind me on a constant basis. So I may have a few things wrong tonight. We're going to do the best we can, though. USDA has not yet uh, issued rules on a bunch of things. So we're going to have to see how those rules actually look at the end of the day. There may be some prizes when those rules come out. Uh, the experience demonstrates that my reading the bill will not always be exactly correct. So there's my disclaimer up front. So we've talked about some of the numbers already. I'm not going to go through every line on here, but kind of note the very bottom line of this chart. Net effect of the 2018 Farm Bill on the overall federal budget, according to the Congressional Budget Office, was zero. So if we took all the laws that were in place before in the 2014 bill, just extend them for 10 years in the future, with all sorts of other quirks about CBO scores things, they were saying this new bill will spend exactly the same amount of money to the nearest million dollars out of roughly a trillion total overall for the next 10 years. And even title by title is shown on the chart. Those changes are relatively small in the grand scheme of things, for the most part anyway. Those are fairly small percentage changes by title. For the most part, we kept money where it was. Okay? On the uh, commodity program side, yes, there are some changes. But it's an evolutionary bill, not a revolutionary bill. If you like the 2014 bill, you probably like the 2018 bill. If you didn't like the 2014 bill, you probably won't like the 2018 bill either. Because it hasn't changed that much. There are some changes on the commodity program side worth mentioning, though. We'll go through them one by one. First, farmers have the ability to update their, their PLC yields in some cases. That could prove important to a lot of people in lots of counties around the country, as we'll talk about. The formula uh, will allow reference prices to rise under some circumstances. If you have a high enough market price, the reference price could actually increase from current levels at least a little bit. The trend adjustment will be used in terms of the benchmark for the agricultural risk coverage program. That's something new. Uh, there'll be multiple opportunities to make new ARC and PLC elections. Last time around, you had one choice for the five-year life of the bill. Now you have one choice in 2019 for the next couple years, then new choices again in 2021, 2022, and in 2023. Higher loan rates for many crops, uh, changes in the payment limitation rules, and some restructuring of the dairy margin program, as, as Ben alluded to. 
So again, looking at the CBO score, here's all the various things that are in the, the Farm Bill for Title I for the commodity programs. If you look at the bottom line of this chart, you see that the overall change in farm program spending under the Title I is what, $263 million over the life of the Farm Bill. Now uh, that's, that's real money, I would take 263 million, I suspect you probably would too. But compared to the overall value of Title I commodity programs, it's less than 1%. You know, so we're talking about changing overall spending on commodity programs by less than 1% here on net, by CBO's reckoning. It's not a lot of new money, at least not by the way, CBO looks to the world. Let's start with that PLC payment yield. So the basic rule is that if your yield between 2013 and 2017 is sufficiently above what your program yield is, it's gonna make sense for you to update your yield. It, the, the, the percentage by which you get to do it uh, relative to those yields depends on your actual, uh, the commodity you're growing and what the yields were between 2013 and 2017. I'm too tall. Yeah, you're taller than all the rest of us. He's just adding to the challenge here a little bit. After that basketball, bar, right? All right. <laughs> so essentially, for the tw if, you're, if your corn yield multiply between 2013 and 2017, multiply 0.81, 81%, is greater than your current PLC yield, it's gonna make sense to update. This is not a complicated decision. Higher is better, you know? So it's not one that requires a lot of thought. You're gonna figure out whether or not it's gonna give you a higher yield to do this or not, you'll do accordingly. So where might this make sense? We've looked at county level data and our best guess as to which counties are most likely to have a positive result from, from increasing your, from going to your 2013 to 2017 yield. So where you may well have a chance to update your yields. So the counties in blue are the ones where that's most likely to occur. You see in Ohio, a north-south divide here and some other states likewise, some very different uh, patterns, in different parts of the country here. Now, just because your county is white does not mean you may not benefit from doing this. This is using county level information. There may be farms within those counties that may still benefit from doing the update. So that's the corn situation. There's the same story for, for soybeans. Not quite as many counties for soybeans that are gonna have the chance to benefit, probably. So again, that's one where you, once the rules are out, you're gonna to go to the office, they're gonna tell you whether that's gonna make sense for your farm to do or not, do what they tell you to do. Reference price adjustment formula. So the reference prices for most major commodities are kept at the current levels under most circumstances. With japonica rice, which I don't think is a big production item here in this county, this part of the world, uh, is one exception to that rule. So the reference price is the higher of the current reference price, so 370 for corn, 840 for soybeans, or 85% of the five-year moving average, Olympic average, throwing out the high, throwing out the low. Is that easy? Okay. So in other words, it can increase if the Olympic average price is more than 17% above the current reference price. Sounds simple, right? Well, it could happen, and, and so there will be circumstances where it does happen. While I was in D.C. on Monday and Tuesday, was to talk about a new stochastic baseline. We've done new projections for the farm economy for the next 10 years. When we solve our models 500 times, this happens occasionally, not very frequently. So we think the chance of a reference price increase is not very high, but it's also not zero going forward. ARC changes. Probably the single biggest change in ARC is that we'll have the ability to use trend-adjusted yields to calculate your benchmark revenue. So instead of just taking the last five years actual yields, throwing out the high, throwing out the low, we're gonna trend adjust those historical yields just like we do for crop insurance. For people are able to take advantage of that in crop insurance. So this is gonna add something to your, your, your ARC benchmark revenue. Exactly how much we're gonna see how the rules come out, but probably in the order, you know, say five bushels or so an acre uh, for corn would be a typical bump up that's gonna come uh, because of this provision. So that makes ARC a little bit more attractive. Likewise, if you have a very low yield, uh, instead of using the actual county yield, you can currently use 70% of that yield. So this will make that 80% of that yield. So again, you're less likely to have a couple of low yields in your overall mix of calculating this benchmark revenue. So both those things will make ARC at least a little bit more attractive than this today. We talked about the elections already. So again, you make one election in 2019, the exact dates of which have not been set yet. You know, sometime later this year, I heard September is one possibility. We'll see how long it takes the USDA to get the rules out and get this implemented in the field. Then you can get revised those elections in, 19, in 2021, 2022, and again in 2023. So instead of one chance for five years, you have four chances for five years. So four chances to get it right or not to get it right, as the case may be. So we did a tool back in 2014, the crew at Illinois likewise did a tool that's out there. Uh, we're working with our colleagues at Texas A&M to once again have a tool available for people. It will be much simpler than last time because there's not as much 
you know, not as many complicated decisions to make this time around. Uh, but we'll talk you through now what some of the, the trade-offs might be here. So first of all, remember that ARC is based on moving averages of things. So we take a five-year moving average of prices and a five-year average of yields, throwing out the high, throwing out the low. Does that mean you know why it's called an Olympic average? Anybody old enough to know what that means? Where that term came from? If you remember the Cold War era, throughout the Olympics, and you were, say, oh, a figure skater, for example, you would get a lousy score from the American judge and a good score from the Russian judge if you're Russian and vice versa if you were the other. So they decided to throw out the high, throw out the low, and average remaining judges to come up with your score. We're doing that for, uh, for various things in farm programs now. So for the first couple years of the, of the 2014 farm bill, we were averaging in a lot of those high prices we had between 2010 and 2013. So we had a 529 was the average price that went into the calculation for ARC for corn. Well, that's not the case anymore. Those high prices of 2010 to 13 are no longer part of the mix. Now we're just averaging in much lower prices. Uh, and so it's 370. In fact, given the way the rules were set up, it's going to be 370 for the next two years no matter what. No matter how high prices go the next year or how low they go the next year, it's going to be 370, period. It might increase in subsequent years or it might not. Soybeans, likewise, a very sharp drop-off in that benchmark uh, price that goes into the revenue calculations. So that alone means that you're less likely, all else equal, to get an ARC benefit in the future than you were during the first couple of years of the 2014 Farm Bill. Let's put that in numbers. So these are now national averages, which mean nothing whatsoever for you, you on your particular farm in your particular county. I know that. But on a national average basis, Yellow bars are what actual payments were between 2014 and 2017, and what our best guess is today for 2018. So the yellow is going to be ARC, the blue is going to be PLC. So on a national average basis, we have very large payments in 2014 for ARC. There were zero payments for PLC because the price was 370, exactly equal to 370. Reference price determines those payments. In 2015, we had a little bit below 370, so we have a small PLC payment for the few people who chose PLC. Again, another year of pretty large ARC payments in much of the country. 2016, 17, guess what? They're about the same. Any given point in the country, they'd be very different, but on average across the country as a whole, the average payment was about the same for folks who chose ARC and people who chose PLC. In 2017, for the first time, they reversed. So in 2017, the average PLC payment was much larger than the average ARC payment. We had a 336 season average price for corn. That's a 34 cent per bushel uh, PLC payment. ARC payments weren't very common because for most of the country had pretty good yields, you know, and, the, and those benchmark revenues have dropped as well. So again, much lower payments there in 2017. Our guess for 2018 is a similar pattern, but lower, uh, lower payments in over PLC if we have a price that's more than 336. The current guess is about 353 in our books for the current marketing year. So that's corn. Here's the same picture for soybeans. So we have yet to make a PLC payment for soybeans, and, and even though I'm showing a number there for 2018, that's because that's an average of 500 possible futures. And so there's a chance if, if markets crash the next couple, three months, we could have a low enough soybean price for the 2018 market year to actually generate a payment. The most likely outcome right now for the current market year is zero because we're looking at a probable price for soybeans around 855 or so. The reference price is 840, so therefore we'd have no, no payment for PLC in the current market year either. There were very large arc payments in, in some parts of the country, especially in 2015. But you note the overall levels here for soybeans are much lower than those for corn. Again, these are national averages. You know, if I talk about my home state of Missouri, 2014, there were basically no ARC payments at all because we had high yields in, 20, in Missouri in 2014. We had crappy yields in, in Missouri in 2015. We had big payments under ARC in that particular year. Wheat. So wheat's the one case I'll talk about in a second where people maybe not have done what they should not have done in retrospect. So here's the actual payment rates that have occurred so far for wheat. So in the first year, once again, we had a, a market price that was above the reference price. So in 2014, when people were signing up, PLC was going to pay zero, and people knew that. So not surprisingly, a lot of people did not sign up for PLC. But then it turned out in 2015, it was about a swap, about a you know even flip a coin sort of thing between the two programs. And then in 2016, we had the disastrous price here, a 389 season average price for the country as a whole. A 550 reference price gave you a very, very large PLC payment if you were in that program. Whereas the ARC payments are capped at 10% of the value of the benchmark, so the average ARC payment is much, much smaller than that. See the numbers for 2017 18, and again, our projections for the current 2018 19 marketing year. 
So again, why this might look less attractive, why ARC may look less attractive in the future than it did last time around. Some of it we've seen already in what's occurred the last couple of years. So what I've done here is I've, I've got two lines. The, the, uh, the, the blue line is going to be uh, the, the benchmark price, if you will, that goes into the calculations. So I'm going to take the moving average of prices, the five-year average, throwing out the high, throwing out the low, multiplying that by 0.86, because that's the magic percentage uh, for ARC. And so if you have an average yield in this particular year, a yield that's equal to your, your benchmark yield, then you would get a payment if and only if the blue line is above the red line. If the red line's above the blue line, you don't get no payment, okay? So the first three years on average across the country, payments remain in ARC, we saw that before. In 2017, it was kind of flip a coin. And in 2018, no payments occur, okay? 2019, 2020, 21, 22, 23, under average conditions, and I stress under average conditions, average prices, average yields, there would now be ARC payments for the next five years. We won't have average prices, we won't have average yields, there will be payments almost for in some year. But it's not like it was in 2014 where we were pretty confident the first couple of years we we're gonna get big ARC payments. That's not the case this time around. That's corn. So again, just making that case that, you know, that, again, we, we've had those, that switch occur. Uh, between uh, the comparison of those things uh, before and after that period of time. Then throw in the 370 reference price, just to, for a point of comparison. So you can see that in the first couple years of the Farm Bill, you know, essentially the price guarantee from ARC was higher than the price guarantee from, from, from PLC, if you had average yields. That's not true going forward. Now mind you, going forward, look at where our prices happen to sit compared to the PLC reference price. We're just ever so slightly above the PLC reference price on our average price projection for the future. So if our average prices were to happen every single year for the next five years, and you had average yields every year, how much would you get in our or PLC payments no matter which one you picked? Zero. So it takes an unusually low price or an unusually low yield to generate payments under either program, okay? A normal yield will not, will not generate payments, given where we're sitting today, given our law for the future at least. Talked about that. Here's the same picture for soybeans. So the same basic story again. The, the first couple of years, you had a likely payment occurring as long as your yields weren't abnormally high under ARC, whereas that's not true anymore. So going forward again, given at least given our price projections right now, the chance of an ARC payment is not very high in the future unless you have bad yields. And there's a reference price for soybeans. Again, it's a tougher call. You, you're not going to have big payments for no matter what you do. Uh, for soybeans unless we have an unusual year, it appears to us. Because we're nerds, we like to show off sometimes. You know, so we solve our models 500 times for different combinations of weather, demand factors, other things that could drive the market. And I won't pretend for a second we've captured every, all the uncertainty out there. All 500 outcomes here, for example, assume that we have current trade relationships continuing. That will probably not prove to be true. There's probably other assumptions we make that probably will prove not to be true. But given the uncertainties we take into account, there's 500 possible outcomes for prices going this way and for yields going that way for the next, uh, for the 2019 crop, the crop we're gonna harvest this fall. So if you take an average of all those outcomes, you get our, you know, the what we publish in our book this week, a 381 price and 174 bushel yield. So if we have an average year, that's what we're looking at. But note that, that, you know, that's not what always happens. You can be well above, well below that on prices, be above that or below on yields, obviously. All else equal, low yields cause high prices and vice versa. But you can have other factors like demand shifts that can cause that not to be true in every single case. It's not just a line, it's the dispersion around that line. So think about what that implies now. So if you have a 370 reference price in 47% of our 500 outcomes for the 2019 marketing year, we would have a PLC payment occurring. So even though our average price is just a little bit above that 370 reference price, there's almost a 50-50 chance of the price being below the, uh, the reference price and therefore generating a PLC payment. So implications. So for corn and soybean producers, ARC was very attractive in 2014, as I said. For 2019, the comparisons may be very different. If actual county yields are equal to the trend-adjusted Olympic average yield, the marking your average price for corn has to be less than 318 a bushel to generate an ARC payment. So I say it again. So if you have an average yield year, you would only get an ARC payment in 2019 if, you're, if the price is below 318 a bushel, okay? 
whereas any price below 370 would generate a PLC payment. So we expect higher participation in the 2019 farm bill than in 2014. This is not to say there will not be producers for whom ARC will be the appropriate choice. I'm not saying that at all. It depends on your local circumstances, what your local yields are, for example. Back in 2014, it made very, very good sense for most corn producers around the country to sign up for ARC. That was the right choice. It proved to be ex, ex post the right choice. For some producers in Missouri, it was not the right choice. Why? Because we had abnormally low yields in the previous five years, so our benchmarks were very low. And so if we were to have normal yields as we did in the subsequent years, we wouldn't get many ARC payments, whereas PLC might pay off. And indeed, we had higher participation in PLC in Missouri than in most other states. It made sense, given our circumstances. That sort of thing could happen again here across the country this next time. So 2014-18 payment rates, uh, you know, this is what actually occurred uh, compared to what, what we projected back in 2015. So in 2015, uh, when people were signing up for the program, we projected an average payment rate for corn of $27 an acre and an average PLC payment rate of $20 an acre over the life of that farm bill. See the numbers there for soybeans and for, uh, uh, for wheat, were our projections back in 2015. And then what's actually occurred, at least what we think has occurred uh, based on the, the first four years we know for sure, 2018, we're still, we don't know for sure. We're guessing on 2018 yet, but we think we have a ballpark guess on that. We are not that good. I want to make that clear. You know, we happen to be with $1 an acre, it looks like right now, as to what the average corn payment turned out to be for ARC within $3 an acre for, uh, for PLC. I will not for a second pretend that was all skill. That was mostly luck. It's really my basketball picks, you know. Luck is more important than, than skill sometimes. But nevertheless, we were saying back then that yes, ARC had an advantage. It wasn't quite as big of an advantage as some people tried to say it was but it wasn't either the right choice for most corn producers. Likewise, for soybean producers, you know, the, and most people were saying at the time, we were saying at the time, ARC was probably gonna be the better choice for most soybean producers. It turned out at the end of the day, the payments were low under both programs, both ARC and PLC, than we anticipated for soybeans. We didn't really have any really awful year on prices or on revenues for soybeans, so we never had a really big payment year for soybeans over the course of the 2018 farm bill. And then wheat, of course, is the one exception to the rule here. So for the most part, producers around the country on average Pick the right program, the program that generated the most payments for them over the life of the bill. Wheat was the exception. So we, we actually have more base enrolled in uh, the uh, 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 ARC program on the 2014 bill, when in retrospect, the PLC program was, was proved to be the one that paid out more on average uh, for most people around the country. We had predicted that at the time. And uh, again, that's one where we, you know, we probably we wish people had been, been willing to look at the numbers, maybe a bit more close than some did at the time. Okay. So uh, uh, what's, what do we expect then for the future? So participation rates. So again, I don't know what participation rates are going to be, nor does anybody else. But given the fact that we are likely to see this shift in average payment rates, we expect that more folks are gonna find PLC attractive next time around than the last time around. It won't be 100%. And I'm sure whatever we put here is not gonna be the right number either. You know, we're basing this primarily on this, these estimates what future payments are gonna be. There will be other considerations at play. As Keith told you, it depends in part on what sort of risk you can handle on your farm. You know, what do you care more about? What what's causes you grief? What keeps you up at night? Should be part of the calculation as well. But if one program pays twice as much as the other program, I know what I'm gonna do. You know, so those considerations are, have to be kept in, in, uh, in perspective. So here's our average payment rates uh, um, uh, for, for ARC and PLC between 2014 and 18 by crop. So we talked about corn and soybeans already and wheat a little bit already. Sorghum PLC was on average the one that paid more. Barley was about a flip of the coin. Um, for 19 to 23, of course, now we reversed the picture. So again, higher average payment range for PLC given our current projections for all the commodities here, although soybeans is much closer than any of the other ones. And then throwing in for kicks uh, for, for sake of, our, of comparison here. I kept corn on the chart so you can see how you know, corn was, you know, Here's corn before. Here's corn now when I put in uh, peanuts and, and rice as my comparison point. Very large payments for those two commodities under PLC. Okay. So participation rates by crop we talked about already. So higher participation rates for PLC we would expect right now. But again, you're going to make the choices on that. You'll have a chance to prove us wrong. And our picture for the future on overall spending looks very similar to CBOs. So like CBO, we project a very large increase in PLC spending in front of us, averaging something like $5 billion a year over the next decade, which by coincidence happens to be almost identical 
to what direct payments were under the previous farm bill, the 2008 farm bill. So it doesn't, didn't have to work out the way, but it happened to work out that way. Whereas our payments get to be pretty small if our projections uh, bear out. Just to remind ourselves how complicated these things can be, here's one county in Missouri. It's a county just northeast of Columbia, Audrain County. So how those calculations work for the current marketing year. So again, we take the, the last five years' prices, we replace any price below 370 with that 370 reference price. We throw out the high price, the 2013 price of uh, 446. We throw out one of the 370s. So 370, 370, 370, that's an average of 370. Okay, that's simple, right? The average yield you see for the county uh, was 158 bushels an acre when you throw out the high and throw out the low. You multiply those two things together, that's 583. You take 86% of that, that's 502. And so for the crop we harvested last fall, a payment's gonna occur in that county if and only if taking the national average price multiplied by the Audrain County yield happens to be less than $502 an acre. Is that likely to happen? Well, we had terrible yields in that particular county. We had flooding and other, or we had droughts, we had droughts sorry, last summer, flooding this year, drought last year, uh, that severely reduced yields in that county. So the NAS estimate for the yield in that county was actually 131 bushels an acre uh, for 2018. So as long as the price is less than 383 for the current marketing year, which it's gonna be, we're gonna get an ARC payment in that particular county this year. If on the other hand, we'd had an average year with a yield of 158 bushels per acre, the same as what the five year average was, then there'd been no payments unless the price was less than 318 a bushel. So again, just how even in a year like this where not many ARC payments have been made nationwide, it can indeed occur if you have a bad, you know, bad yield year, whereas PLC depends only on the national average price. So things to note, the right choice will differ by crop, by county, and by producer. So the relationship between expected ARC and PLC payments differs across crops. PLC may seem an obvious choice for many crops, uh, while it's a closer call for others. Soybeans is one where it's a closer call. County yield history matters a lot. ARC will be more likely to pay in some counties than others. If you've had a really good yield history in your county, that's gonna make your ARC benchmarks very high. If you think that's an abnormally high yield we've had the last five years, you know, then that makes ARC more attractive, all else equal and vice versa. Uh, PLC program yields. You know, their farm specific factors can make, mean different farms within a county can have different optimal choices. And then finally, what type of risk is of greater concern? Longer term depressed prices, if that's your worry, that's what keeps you up at night. PLC is the program for you. If on the other hand, a short term drop in revenues that could be caused by either prices or yields, that makes ARC more attractive, all else equal. Loan rates. So we've increased loan rates for uh, most major commodities, at least somewhat. In the case of corn and soybeans, we go from buck 95 to $2.20 a bushel for the national average loan rate for corn. We go from $5 a bushel to $6.20 per bushel as a national average loan rate for soybeans. Each county has its own loan rate. That can be a bit different than that. So that's an increase that, of course, doesn't necessarily mean we're gonna have any payments under that program. We would like to hope we don't have corn prices below $2.20 a bushel. We'd like to hope we don't have soybean prices below $6 a bushel but nevertheless, it does give you some marketing opportunities where you can you know, place a crop under loan at the harvest time, get more cash in your pocket for doing so than you could have under the previous bill. Other Title I provisions, uh, changes in the payment limitation rules. Nieces, nephews, and first cousins are more likely, more likely to qualify as, as uh, active participants than was in the case in the past. I am not a lawyer. If you have questions, ask Jonathan about anything there. Seed cotton provisions are a big deal for all of you here, I'm sure, right? Okay, we won't talk about that. Uh, no ARC or PLC payments of no crop planted on base acres in the last 10 years. So if you have a farm and you have not planted anything for the last 10 years on that farm, and it's only been in grass for the last 10 years, you no longer can receive ARC or PLC payments for the next, for life of this farm bill at least. You don't lose the base, but for the life of the farm bill, you cannot receive payments for ARC or PLC. You can instead receive a CSP payment of $18 per acre. Okay, now let's think about the politics. You know, we talked a lot about politics in the previous two presentations. Anybody know where the chairman of the Senate Ag Committee is from? Great state of Kansas, right? Kansas. How's an $18 an acre payment rate sound for somebody in western Kansas? That may not be too bad. Let's say you're a rice producer in Mississippi, to pick on somebody else in the audience here. That may not be a very good payment. So there's probably some folks in some parts of the country not very happy about this provision, some other parts of the country where it's not such a big deal. Here I suspect you don't have that many acres affected. Dairy, just real briefly, um, you know, again, we've got a pretty major change. This is a far bigger change on dairy than would be the case on the crop side. Uh, we are, we've significantly changed the level of, of coverage that's available 
and the cost of that coverage for the first 5 million pounds of production on a farm. So previously you could not get coverage levels as high. Now you get a coverage level as high as $9.50 per hundredweight. So the difference between the milk price and the feed price, if it's less than $9.50 per hundredweight, you can get a payment if you've chosen to buy the higher level of coverage. The cost of that coverage is only 15 cents a hundredweight. Uh, that's amazingly cheap, to be honest. I mean, that is not an actuarial cost of that level of coverage. That level of coverage is not available for production above 5 million pounds on a farm. In fact, the big, highest level available for, the, for uh, a large farmer or for those last production above 5 million is $8 per hundredweight, and that costs very, very much to do so. So we don't expect many folks with, with very large operations to insure beyond the 5 million pound uh, level. Is that going to pay out or isn't it? Well, of course, we don't know. But you see the top line there is the 950. So if you bought the highest level of coverage available, the middle line in red there is going to be our projected average margin for the next several years. You know that every single year our average margin is less than 950 maximum that, that you can buy. So that means every single year if those projections were to be borne out, you would be able to get a benefit from this program. And in fact, the benefit would be greater than the cost of the premium you'd have to pay. So it looks to us like that for many, many small producers, this program will indeed provide them some benefit. Is it enough to keep every small producer in business? It is not. I have four cousins who are still dairy farming, uh, two of them operating my grandparents' farms on either side of the family. And I'm not confident of their ability to survive, frankly, given how tough these times are right now. This will provide at least some benefit to the small scale producer. So kind of putting all the pieces together and I'll wrap up here before too long. Uh, I looked at what happens if you just uh, compare farm bills, if you will. So in each set of the following slides, the first bar is going to be what actually occurred between 2008 and 2013, so the life of the 2008 farm bill, the farm bill before we put these new programs in place. The second set of bars is going to be 2014 to 17. That's actual data that's been collected by FSA. Those should be good numbers, in other words. 2018 is our own projection. It may not be exactly right, but it should be in the ballpark. The next one's going to be 2019 to 2023, the life of the new farm bill based on CBO's estimates. And then right next to that are estimates for the same thing. So first is going to be Title I, you know, the commodity programs that was my charge to talk about tonight. So between 2008 and 2013, we spent about $5 billion a year on direct payments and next to nothing on anything else. You know, we had Acre, but hardly anybody participated, never paid out the life of that farm bill. Um, marking loans were irrelevant during those years of high prices. So again, direct payments were almost the entire set of Title I payments under that farm bill. Between 2014 and 2017, we had the years of very large ARC payments. So the blue part of the bar there is very large. And it turns out that the sum of ARC and PLC during the life of the, those first four years of the farm bill was actually greater than we had spent on direct payments on the previous farm bill, suggesting that that shift was actually a good one to have made. We wouldn't have had that kind of level payments probably unless ACRE had paid out a bunch. In 2018, of course, much lower payments, for the reasons we talked about on the ARC side. Uh, 2019 to 23, both CBO and we say about $5 billion a year on payments on average. It could be as near zero some years, it could be very, very large some years, but an average of $5 billion on PLC. We're saying a little bit different numbers on ARC. We have actually a little bit more than CBO does on the ARC side, but not much either there. And then we actually have some possibility of some marking loan benefits once in a while. Not so much for corn and soybeans, but primarily for cotton and for some other crops uh, now grown in this part of the country. Okay, same chart, all I've done now is add to that chart the average net indemnities to farmers for crop insurance benefits. So not the total cost of the crop insurance program, but just the part that goes to farmers directly. What farmers pay, or what farmers get back in indemnity payments minus what the farmers paid in premiums. So once I add that to the mix, you know, the, the comparison of, of the 2008 and 2014 farm bills looks different, right? So instead of the 2014 farm bill being more expensive as it was focusing only on Title I, once I add in crop insurance, the 2014 farm bill was actually lower cost, or lower benefits at least to farmers, than was the case under the 2008 farm bill. Why? Because we had really large crop insurance payments in 2012 in particular, but didn't have any sniffing of payments uh, since the, the 2014 farm bill went into place. See again our estimates there for 2018 and for 2019 through, through 23, both CBO and ours. Again, we're telling similar stories here, just a little bit slightly different levels. Then let's throw in MFP. So throw in that eight to nine billion dollars of MFP payments that have been paid out uh, for, for uh, trade assistance this past year. So now instead of 2008 being the low year, 2008 is now the high year. 
of these comparisons when we fill that in the mix, 12 and 18, I should say. And then finally, throw in the conservation payments. This is our guess about what the conservation payments of farmers would be on a calendar year basis, taking CBO's estimates for the future and doing some allocation, how much that results in actual payments to producers. So again, when you look at the final uh, set of bars there, either CBOs or ours, it turns out that we've got roughly five to $6 billion a year of ARC and PLC, Title I benefits, roughly five or $6 billion per year of crop insurance, then indemnities, and roughly $5 billion per year of, of uh, conservation benefits to farmers. So guess what, you know, three titles doing roughly the same level of support to farm the farm sector going forward, on average. So things to note, Again, ARC and PLC under 2014 were similar to direct payments under 2008. String of above average yields have kept crop insurance costs very low during the life of the 2014 Farm Bill. We assume more average weather, more variability in front of us. That, that's why it's not because of any change in policy, it's just because of assumed differences in weather in front of us. That 2018 uh, bill uh, crop insurance goes up a bit. See the MFP numbers and the comparison there between us. So my last, final couple slides here, you know, some big picture stuff for the sector as a whole. Left hand chart is overall direct government payments. So it'll be ARC, PLC, dairy payments, conservation reserve payments, other direct payments farmers get from the government. With the highest year being 2018 because of those very large MFP payments. They remain large in 2019 calendar year because not only because of ARC and PLC that might be made, but primarily frankly because a lot of the MFP payments were made after the 1st of January. So some of the MFP shows up in 18, some of it shows up in 19. The right hand side is net farm income estimates. So you can see the, uh, the sharp drop from the peak, over $120 billion in net farm income for the country as a whole in 2013, down to you know, the low 60s in both 2016 and 2018. 2019, yes, is a little bit better, but not much in our projections and in USDA's projections. Uh, and the improvement in subsequent years is also very modest. It doesn't keep going down, thank goodness. Once you correct for inflation and we get to a certain level about 2020 or so, and we remain there for the life of our 10-year basin, if I showed you more over the future, and so on this chart. Farm real estate values, uh, the yellow bars are gonna be Ohio national, or Ohio average uh, real estate values according to NAS, the National Ag Statistics Service. Orange is gonna be the national average. We are doing projections for Ohio yet, although we could talk to Ben about maybe doing that in the future. Uh, but for uh, the country as a whole, relatively flat real estate values in front of us is what we're currently projecting. Given, you know, study to only slightly increasing net farm income, higher interest rates than we've had, the incentives we've had to increase land values aren't there anymore. So instead of a 50% increase that we actually experienced between 2009 and 2018, I think our interest, our increase between 2018 and 2028, if I extend this chart out farther, is a whopping 2%. You know, so a very different story in front of us than we've seen. Rental rates, likewise, relatively flat on average. Obviously, different parts of the country with very different experience, both historically and in the future. So it's not the 1980s, but. So this one's giving you a longer sweep of history. Not quite as, as long as uh, some of Jonathan's longer sweeps of history, but going back to the 80s. This uh, debt asset ratio is a good indicator of the overall financial. It's not a perfect indicator by any means. It's an overall indicator. Don't worry so much about the levels, but worry about the changes. So in 1985, at the height of the farm crisis, the national average ratio of all the farmers' debts divided by all the farmers' assets was 22.2%. Uh, That's the highest it had been in recorded history. That's of people who had debt, of course. A lot of folks didn't have any debt. Those who didn't have debt, take those out of the mix. Those who had debt, be a much higher percentage than that. That average dropped by half between 1985 and 2012. We were down to 11.3%, I believe it was, in 2012. Since 2012, it's been creeping up. 13.5% in 2018, USDA says. And our projections, it gets to about 15% about by the time we get to year 2028. So it's not the 80s, it's not the 80s, but it's not the right direction. So this is the current, you know, keeping the world looking like it does today future. I think the job of all of us in the room is figure out a way not to let this happen. You know, what can we do to make this not be the outcome at the end of the day? We hope these projections sometimes are self-defeating and we'll make changes that will avoid them from happening in front of us. So thanks very much. I wanted to tell Ben I was going to use this picture one last time. This is a group shot of our, of our photo from maybe not this year, maybe not last year, maybe more than a couple years ago at this point. Uh, but it's been great having, having a chance to be here tonight. And again, thanks to you all for, for being here, and thanks to Ben for the invitation. Thanks. I gotta lower the mic now, I'm not that tall. <laughs>
Um, yes, yeah, so, so uh, let's give another round of applause for all of our, all three of our speakers tonight. I was sitting in the back over there and looked down the row and I think everybody had a pencil and paper out and we're, we're taking notes, so that was a good sign for us too. I do want to just kind of clarify, I'll invite our speakers up and we'll start the question panel here in just a second. If you do have questions, um, you know, make sure you fill them out on the card and we'll collect them and ask some questions. I got some questions to start off with tonight, but I do want to clarify um, just kind of what actually uh, happened with that basketball tournament. Has anybody selected basketball teams with a group of economists before? I'll tell you what happens. You know, ESPN comes out with rankings, you know, one through 64 teams. Economists never pick upsets. So for me, who picked Ohio State over Iowa State, I got no benefit for that because they all picked the, the right, or the, the highest ranked team. So until we get incentives, I think I'm going to continue to falter. But so a couple of questions. Again, if you have questions, you know, let us know. We'll be glad to. But all three of you kind of mentioned, actually, um, Dr. Westhoff, you didn't, but um, it applies to yours as well. Uh, the relation is we look forward uh, in the area, era of big data. Um, we talked about crop insurance. We talked about conservation and then commodity programs in the area of big data and how that's going to influence our policy as we move forward. And my question, I guess, is if you could expand a little bit on that and explain how the role of producers in our mind, you know, the way we, the way we produce our crop and the way we go about management in this era of big data is going to have to change um, if we want to continue to be viable, um, at least in terms of government programs and, and farm income and stuff like that. So I don't know who wants to take it first. Dr. Coble mentioned it in his first slide. but Sure. I think it's going to change a lot of things. Um, the fact that we have CLU data on a lot of farmland now is going to allow some ability to uh, administer programs at a more refined level. Uh, it's certainly going to allow us to rate crop insurance more accurately. Uh, as I mentioned, I think we'll put the crop data layer, uh, soil, soil index layer underneath the rating system. As, as Jonathan spoke, one of the things that I thought about is that I think you're going to see initiatives in certain instances where consumer-driven concern about conservation is going to lead to conservation activities to respond to the market, not necessarily due to a regulation. Uh, we're seeing some things in the South that uh, are really interesting as producers try to validate their sustainability and I think big data is going to be the way that is done uh, and and you, you know I'm still trying to wrap my head around blockchain technology uh, all I have been all I can get my head around is it's like the VIN number on your car uh, but you're going to be able to follow a bale of cotton or a bushel of corn all the way from the farm and verify that it was grown in a particular fashion. Anybody have any other? No, I, I would agree. I mean, data is going gonna, is gonna to potentially help a lot. <laughs> it's going to add a lot of pressures. I think the consumer side of this is absolutely a big deal with that. I also think there's a, there's a real potential um, in some of the things that we're working on now of using it, and we've seen it in trying to develop tools for farmers and decision making, that there's a real potential for uh, the use of data coming out of research and being able to better translate some of the research out to, to farmers and put it in a usable format. Um, so I think there's a lot of potential, a lot of good upside, but it's going to, you know, it's going to be another management uh, challenge and issue that, that we work through. And again, there's, you know, the more information people have, that can help and it can hurt. So I think there's going to be a lot of work to have to be done around that. Um, but I think it makes for some exciting stuff ahead of us. Excellent. Uh, so we had a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, do you see AIPs and Farm Service Agency going to war uh, in the next Farm Bill or anytime soon uh, to service producers' crop insurance needs? <laughs> it's a great question. If they do, I think I know who will win. <laughs> <laughs> it will be the AIPs. Um, I, 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 the, the crop insurance industry has become quite savvy. Uh, the fact that there were some very serious efforts to 
restrict payments and subsidies and so forth, uh, and that none of those got added as amendments on the floor. Uh, I, I think there was significant lobbying by the crop insurance industry, and, and I don't, I don't foresee that that fight really happening anytime soon. Uh, I, I think there'll be other fights, but but I don't think that's one. All right, cool. <laughs> They're awfully quiet. <laughs> what trends, if any, are evident in the percentage of highly erodible lands that have fallen out of compliance? It specifically says for Jay Coppice. <laughs> Somebody planted that one. That's yeah. a very good question. Um, I'll just have to be honest. I don't know what percentage trends have, coming, have come out of compliance. Uh, that is something we'll have to dig into. And I don't know if either one of you have information on that. I don't. Um, I, I don't think... Uh, there's a real high non-compliance percentage out there. I mean, it's not the kind of thing where we see a lot of real issues on, particularly in highly erodible. Where we saw the biggest issue on compliance, uh, particularly in 14, was wetlands in some of the northern plains, where we've seen a climatic shift in a lot of formerly dry acres or thought were dry, were wet, and uh, that ran into some issues. But I don't think we've seen a lot of problems with compliance in highly erodible. So, yeah, I think I think Jonathan's right about that. Uh, I think it's also important to recognize that the degree to which compliance is enforced around the country is maybe not exactly the same in every county. And so compliance means different things in practice on the field around the country. So sticking with the same kind of topic, the next question is, what consideration is given to increased extreme participation events and the compliance standards with highly erodible land? Um, so I, we've seen an increase, uh, Aaron Wilson, our state climatologist, is here talking, you know, an, an increase in, in these large rain events that, you know, we, we're seeing changes in participation in total, but we're also seeing larger rain events at the same time. And what consideration is that being taken into compliance with working lands? So right now I don't, I don't think you're seeing that change much in the terms of compliance, but it's certainly... If, if we're looking forward, right, that's, that's going to complicate that policy. It's going to complicate the way we look at it uh, pro next farm bill or down the road. If we I actually say this not just for, for soil loss issues and, and erosion, but this nutrient loss challenge uh, grows significantly if we are, you know, if you think about in particular nitrogen leaving the field from tile, subsurface tile. Well, that is largely, most of that happens in, this, in the late winter, early spring as we thaw out and that nitrogen leaches down through the soil and into the tile and out. If we start to see uh, shorter, warmer winters and we start to see heavier rain events in the spring, we're going to see our nutrient loss problem expand around that or grow around it because we're going to be flushing more nitrogen out of those tiles with the increase in rain. So I, I, I don't know that, I don't know how to answer that directly on soil, uh, on highly erodible land issues, although again, we've seen time and time again policy and political pressure if soil erosion increases on a large scale. So right now I don't see another policy, but I think if you begin to see those weather events really push us into another uh, erosion challenge, then, if, then be ready for the policy to adapt to that uh, pretty relatively quickly in the policy space. Excellent. Dr. Westoff, this one's one for you. Um, for the dairy margin coverage program, um, can we speculate why they continue to stay with the historical base lines for the, the years for the dairy margin coverage program. Sure. So, so one of the concerns for the, for the DMC program is what might this do to production? Mm -hmm. So the concern is if you provided you know, as much coverage as is available on every single pound that you currently produce, it might be an incentive for people to expand production even further than they were going to. Anyway, uh, you know, as it is with only the first 5 million pounds, that's a lot for a small scale producer. The most production in the country is now on farms that are larger than that. So that's why at least most people contend that the overall effect of this program on production may not be that great. But yes, I know the base issue has been one that's been very important for people. Yeah. So a connection with crop insurance, or excuse me, conservation and the commodity title, uh, the question that came in is, can we increase conservation emphasis um, without hurting farm slash crop income uh, from, the, from the producer side? Is it possible? Yeah, I, I think these policies can be adapted to do a better job around that, right? So a simple example, right now our conservation policies don't take into account 
price risk issues the way we do in these programs. Is it possible to redesign or rethink some of these to begin doing a better job of saying, yeah, a farmer, uh, a farmer in a high price year, or high price series of years may not need the same level of conservation assistance that they would need in a low price year. So uh, just to give one, you know, sort of uh, self serving example, I worked with Illinois Farm Bureau on an idea that created uh, a change to the marketing loan program. So instead of just the loan rate as it is now, you, would, you could borrow on a loan rate that dealt with conservation issues. And so it would be a higher loan rate and you only paid back again if, it, if, if prices were, were below it. So you got some conservation assistance as well as uh, the ability to offset that if, if prices were lower. So I think it's entirely possible, certainly from writing and designing a program side, it's really the political question. Is there a push to do so? Is there a demand for policies that do a better job across both the farmer risk question, particularly price risk, and the conservation challenges that we see? Excellent. Uh, moving back to crop insurance, and, and Dr. Coble, you talked about this during your presentation, the political uh, challenges with the crop insurance and, and the need for it, but then also these disaster aid payments that we're starting to see more frequently. Could you expand on that a little bit and explain how the frequency of disaster aid payments along with the, you know, the fundamental basis for crop insurance um, could work together in the future for a viable program? Well, so last year with the hurricane damage in Florida and the southeast, this year with the flooding situations that we're looking at in, in uh, the Plain States and, uh, and other locations, I think we're going to see some questions come up where uh, there's concern that ad hoc disaster is going to uh, compensate people uh, when perhaps the, the intended incentive was for them to buy crop insurance. In other instances, you're going to have, I know uh, with the Florida growers, uh, insurance on specialty crops has always been challenging. Uh, there's a variety of reasons why that is. So the argument was made is that the crop insurance participation in that region wasn't sufficient. Uh, you know, when we look at uh, the situation with flooding in in Nebraska in recent weeks, you could ask yourself, um, you, you know, what about the grain that ended up on the ground that's going to spoil and rot? Uh, that's not that's not covered by crop insurance. What do you do there? Uh, livestock, you know, our products for livestock uh, uh, insurance are largely price programs. They don't really protect against um, a major death loss due to a winter storm and things like that. So that's the, to the extent that you can have two separate conversations, I think that the challenge is with ad hoc, you're always trying to buy political votes to get it across the finish line. And in the process, you're probably going to uh, add some payments that are kind of marginal in terms of whether they're redundant or whether they're of the magnitude that uh, you make them because you don't sim you simply did not know what the value was there. I'm not a big fan of ad hoc disaster in general. I'm very sympathetic to the situation where crop insurance wasn't doing the job. But, but I think uh, this is probably a conversation we're going to keep having for a while. And and the, 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 the market facilitation payments with, with China are essentially ad hoc payments as well. So we've really gone from not doing any kind of ad hoc payment for a long time to really significant levels in the last two years. Whether this is an aberration or whether this is the future, I don't know. These two guys might have a better sense about that. So I was on Capitol Hill in 2000, uh, or 1994, I should say, when the crop insurance bill was uh, was put in place. And I remember all the discussions we had at the time where we were going to make it impossible, impossible for us to ever have another ad hoc disaster program. Create all these legislative and you know, bureaucratic, it just couldn't happen. Well, it happened just a few years later. In 2000, we revised crop insurance to make sure it would never happen again. It happened again. Same thing on direct payment. You know, when the direct payment program was put in place initially in 1996, we were done making payments to farmers based on prices. We were done telling making payments based on you know, production. Well, that's not how it's played out in reality. It, there is a lot of incentive for, for uh, policymakers to want to do things for which they get credit. 
keeping what's currently in place doesn't get you credit for making a change. You know, so it's, it's, it's a tough thing to do to say you're never going to do something again when maybe a circumstance comes up that hadn't been anticipated. And so, you know, the incentives are there to do something. You know, I, I think one of the things I would add is we, in 2008, we created a standing disaster program. So for livestock uh, losses, if you lose livestock to weather, you can get indemnities from FSA for that. And you saw that as a push in response, again, to not only crop insurance, but then to try to get something in Title I to say we need to have something that, that replaces ad hoc assistance. I think what, what we also should consider uh, to continue the theme or the argument that I've been making is that as these are more and more weather uh, challenges, do we see a push, uh, a political push back the other way to say, what are we doing to build resilience uh, from some, you know, wiping out a grain bin from flood is a lot harder, but, uh, but some of these we may see that kind of political pressure as well to look at, is it a standing program, is there some sort of combined assistance that helps us avoid coming back time and again in an ad hoc scenario, but also recognizing just the unpredictable nature that some of these, uh, that all of these disasters present. So let's talk a little bit about payment limitations. Um, and I want to frame this in kind of the form of the, the consolidation. <laughs> They're passing the mic already. They don't want to answer. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I haven't had a chance to look at the, the census data that came out today, but my assumption is that we're going to continue to see consolidation within the ag industry. I, I think when I look tomorrow, I assume that'll be there. And there's a lot of connection, a lot of people that would place the blame on lack of payment limitations within farm programs within the, the farm bill. And so we'll, we had that debate uh, this time um, as well in the farm bill um, from some supporters of farm programs and from major ag producing states. And so when we think about payment limitations moving forward, where do you see those fitting in? Uh, do we continue to see you know, support across you know, different sectors that maybe are with even in the coalition that agriculture depends on? That's not fair. <laughs> uh, the payment limit issue um, is one of the more uh, entertainingly contentious issues in a farm bill debate. Uh, it really complicates uh, for something that frankly impacts very few farmers most of the time. Uh, it really complicates the politics, particularly the regional politics, sorry, not the mm -hmm. <laughs> pick on Mississippi, the regional politics uh, around the farm programs. But it also is one of these issues where the politics, the, the perception outside of farming, you know, is driving a lot of this pressure as well. So, look, the trend of consolidation has been, I mean, this has predated even the New Deal programs. Uh, and, but certainly since World War, World War II, we've seen this trend uh, um, of fewer farmers and more consolidation. The larger farm, the larger the farm, the payments are production based and, you know, they're, they're going to see larger payments. And so, that political challenge is not going to change. Um, payment limits are not going to go away. Uh, in fact, you know, as we've seen, they're going to migrate even further into crop insurance questions with a whole lot of uncertainty about what that does to an insurance program. Um, but, you know, I, I, I remember painfully some of the AGI debates and, and payment sub, or subsidy, uh, premium subsidy debates. You're dealing with an issue that uh, you can only argue so much about. Right? There's only so much, we don't know what it's going to do, we don't, but, but people see the numbers. Uh, we have fewer than 2 million farmers in this country and they're receiving 15 to $20 billion a year. Um, frankly, the more we see certain members of Congress pick fights on SNAP, the more you're going to see payment limits be an issue. Uh, the, what the House did in this Farm Bill debate, I think, um, not to pick on the house, I just think it's going to reverberate for a while in the politics because we went after SNAP in one way and tried to open up payment limits the other. And that kind of situation is going to be a challenge going forward. So I, I think there's more to it than just what does it do. It's really how the perception of this looks. Uh, and as we see tough times drive consolidation, it's only going to, I think, magnify that challenge. I guess I will add one small point here. If you look at what's happened, there's actually been votes on the floors uh, about payment limitation related issues. If it's perceived to be a free vote where people can vote what they <laughs> want to vote, uh, a payment limitation almost always wins. A tighter payment limitation almost always wins. But it's only if there's a coalition that, you know, is trying to hold together that we'll, we'll try to fight them back. Yeah, that's a great point. That is, and I would add, I don't, I, I think every farm bill you will see 
a push for payment limits. I can't see that not happening. Uh, and, and there'll be various forms of it. I think it's interesting while we've, we mostly talk about crops, in dairy, in effect, we have a completely different system for small farmers. It's not a payment limit system, but it is. That is a program that is really favoring small producers. But Pat's expression of concern that it may not actually make a difference has to do, I think, and th this is true across dairy and our crop industries, is what's driving consolidation is the economies of scale in agriculture. And I'm not sure that payment limits are really going to stop. It, 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 it will be a political maneuver, but does it really stop the technological change that's driving consolidation in agriculture? I'm somewhat skeptical. Excellent. So we're getting pretty close to nine o'clock for our deadline. And so uh, please join me in welcome, or thanking our speakers for coming to Ohio and being part of us. We thank each and every one of you for being with us tonight. Um, and just a, one simple <laughs> reminder, we have lots of food left over. Um, they've asked that you stop by and pick something up before the evening news tonight uh, and to have for dinner. So thank you again. Um, also, there, you'll get a survey um, in the next couple of days. We ask that you please fill out that survey as we have some students that are going to do some research with it. And so we thank you very much for your attention tonight. And thank you, and we'll see you again in a couple of years. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. You got a great set of slides.